what's happening, everybody. Welcome to the program. It's the Jeff Gerstmann Show. It is September 24th, 2024. And I am your host for this week's edition of the program. My name is Jeff Gerstmann. And uh, I I just want to talk about UFO 50. I, that's, I don't want... I don't want trouble, man. I don't want to, I don't want problems. I just want to talk I just want to talk about UFO 50. That's, that's pretty much That's pretty much it. I don't know. Every everyone has been sick. <laughs> that is the the happenings around here is that everyone has been getting better from being sick and thus as everyone was just about better uh yesterday, uh the baby got sick. So that's trouble because when the baby's nose is stuffed, the baby can't nurse, and there's a whole, it's a lot. Poor kid. She's uh, she's still all smiles though, for the most part. Um, but yeah, we gotta get on the other side of this crap. It's just it's the it's the freaking worst, and you know, trying to schedule flu shots and all this other stuff around, and then it's like, oh well, the kids are sick, can't take them can't take them in for shots when they're already sick they don't they don't they frown on they tend to frown on that and they're like hey if you're if your kid's already got a cold and you're bringing them in for flu shots just don't and you're like oh well why I mean, why and i was like because all the other kids are get sick and you're like I, okay all right i guess okay i guess i guess i see that i guess i see that but it's a hassle so here we are um hey UFO 50 came out. Um, it is a collection of 50 different games. If you're not familiar, this game was announced, uh, was it 2017 or something like that? A very long time ago. And then um, kind of got delayed, kind of fell off the radar, and Spelunky 2 happened in the middle of all that somewhere. And, uh, and uh, yeah, so it's from Moss Mouth, the, you know, the, the studio behind the Spelunky games. Uh, but it's a crew of, I believe it's like six people just kind of like sat down and made 50 games. Um, primarily, uh, those, those six, I think some, some more than others or, you know, the, the lineage of the games, it's not like quite a one-to-one, like this person made this game or this per- person made this, the, the way they're framing it is like, Hey, you know, over the course of all these years, everyone touched a little bit of everything and you know, a, a lot happened. So it's not, it's not as easy as like. This is this person's game, and this is this person's game. And um, well, I'm sure if you got down to it and figured out the ideas and and who came up with what, I'm sure there are answers to those questions. But ultimately, it's not maybe all that important. Um, but UFO 50 is a compilation of 50 games for um, a video game console that never existed, and uh, they. Uh, called the the LX or the LX2 or even the LX Model 3 um and it's it covers a period of time in the 80s from earlier in the 80s to the late 80s and it's not you know you, you if you're going into this thinking like oh this is too many colors or too many frames of animation for 1984 or 85 or, or you know like you're going to have a bad time it, it's pretty fast and loose with that specific end of it they didn't literally go out and create an instruction set and go okay we're going to make all the games on this fake machine and you know they they that that's not the that's not the rabbit hole that they that they went down um but instead they made 50 games and you kind of go into them sight unseen you know when you when you get this thing or when i got this thing i didn't know a damn thing about any of the games that were collected in in here um and so uh it's an amazing feeling of surprise as you go through these games and i've like latched on to games and been like oh this is the best game in the compilation this has to be the the best one and i'll play that for five or six hours and then go like oh i'll check out the next one what's this one about and then be like completely blown away not every single game is a straight up banger, but there are enough awesome games in here that are like some of the best things I have done this year, you know, in, in this year in video games. 
Um, and then even the ones that aren't maybe like incredible video games, a lot of those have ideas that you just look at and go like, that's a fucking amazing idea for a video game. And they don't, you know, maybe it's not fleshed out the right way, or maybe there's just something um, like, oh, if, if you had three lives instead of one, maybe this would be a, a more a reasonable video game, or if it, you know, was a little bit longer, or in some cases, a little bit sh uh, shorter, um, maybe that would be a, a, a better thing. But it, it's... It's an astounding variety. You know what? I, we got to take an ad break. Let's, let's take that ad break and we'll come back and I will talk to you about Pilot Quest for a while. How, how about that? Come, uh, Pilot Quest talk on the other side of this break. This episode is brought to you in part by iRestore, the clinically proven game-changing hair growth device that's here to help you turn back the clock on hair loss. So listen up if your hair's not where you want it to be. iRestore's FDA-cleared laser and LED system is not just some gadget. It's a crazy advanced approach to hair restoration that you can use right at home. The iRestore Elite, which is the most powerful device on the market, is engineered with 500 lasers and LEDs designed to provide maximum scalp coverage and deliver the energy necessary to revive dormant hair follicles. The iRestore Elite uses low-level light therapy, that's LLLT, a treatment that has been clinically proven to stimulate cellular activity in your hair follicles. That stimulation increases the blood flow to the scalp, delivering essential nutrients and oxygen to help reduce inflammation, one of the key factors that can contribute to hair loss. In a few months, you'll start to see noticeable improvements as your hair regains its vitality. Without drugs, weird, painful procedures, expensive surgeries, it is the most non-invasive, pain-free, and drug-free way to bring your hair back to life, backed by real science. Whether you're just starting to see that the hairline is retreating a little bit, or if you're already in a spot where you never take your hat off, iRestore can change your life. And for a limited time only, you can get $625 off your order when you use the code JEFF at iRestoreLaser.com. That's your order at iRestoreLaser.com with the promo code Jeff. In a four-month double-blind clinical study performed by a board-certified dermatologist, 100% of the study participants grew more hair with iRestore's laser and LED technology. So you can feel confident that you're buying a system with proven results. All right, so, you know, you heard about it. Are you ready to get medical-grade red light treatment at home to regrow your hair? For a limited time only? You can get $625 off your order when you use the code Jeff at iRestoreLaser.com. That's your order at iRestoreLaser.com with the promo code Jeff. Hair loss. Only a frustrating thing, right? You don't have to fight it alone. Thanks to iRestore. Okay, Pilot Quest is like the 40, it, it's, it's, uh, what, what number game is it in UFO 50? Um, it is the 44th game. Um, you may have seen a lot of, uh, recommendations from other people that are playing this game saying like, oh, you should start Pilot Quest because if you, you, it has things in it that, you know, you should start it while you're playing other games. And that's a sensible thing to do. It's kind of an idle game. It is kind of a, um, uh, it is an incremental game. It is a resource management game, but it is a resource management game that works when it is not running. But UFO 50 has to be running in some capacity. If you turn the game off completely, you're not going to earn anything. So I I made that mistake. Um, and so while you're playing other games in the collection, you will be earning crystals. And so it it is a game where you are you are getting your hands on some crystals and you are using that to upgrade, like basically you, your spaceship crashed in this tiny encampment uh, full of a, a bunch of goofy aliens. Um, and you are getting crystals to turn them into ingots and you're using the ingots to buy houses and then aliens move into the houses and the aliens can be put to work mining more ingots and so on and so forth. And there's a tech tree along the way. If you have a yo-yo that you use to you hit the crystal with if you want to get things um, directly. 
uh, instead of just letting them letting time tick by uh, as you upgrade the yo-yo uh, then you are going to get your hands on more crystals and, and so on and so forth but there's more you also get meat and when you give meat to a guy he gets out of the way and lets you walk off into the wild zone and in the wild zone, you basically so each each piece of meat that you give him is is good for two minutes of time in the wild zone. And so you go out into the wild zone, and there are like Zelda, the Legend of Zelda esque dungeons. Um, there's a whole overworld. There's caves that you're going into, and uh, with aliens in there that you're talking to and performing tasks for, and uh, and and you basically need to get out there and find your ship pieces like it was Toe Jam and Earl or something. Um, as well as there's other stuff out there to find and enemies to attack and all this other stuff. And every time you get hit by an enemy, the damage they do impacts your time. And so you'll get hit for 30 seconds worth of damage, basically. And if you only have two minutes total, that's a lot. Um, and so you need to get more meat next time you go. So you can be like, I've got 1500 seconds now. I can get out there and really do some damage. Um, and so it's about planning your runs because if you die in the wild zone or if you run out of time in the wild zone, you have to get back before time expires. You can't just let it expire. Um, you drop everything like it was the fucking division. Um, and so it's an extraction yo-yo game, I guess. Um, and at that point you're using the yo-yo to hit enemies and, and, and everything else. And, um, so it becomes this push and pull of, okay, I need more meat so I can get out of the wild zone, make some things happen. You're getting some resources and some ingots and, and whatever else while you're out there. Um, but also back at base, you're kind of accruing more stuff as you go as well. And you'll find people or creatures that are out there that will help you get the additional resources you need because there's resources you're not even accruing at the beginning of the game. Like science. For example, you need science for some of these upgrades. And so there's items and people and other stuff that you can find to kind of get what you need to basically work your way to the end of the tech tree, which is fuel for your spaceship. And then you find the ship parts, you get your spaceship rebuilt and ostensibly flee the planet, right? Um, it's not quite that simple, but um, it's really awesome. It is a killer idea. The catch in Pilot Quest, I would say, is twofold. One, it takes a little too long to mine the resources. The early game is a little slow. And the late game could be a little bit longer. There could be more to find. There could, I mean, there could always be more to find, right? Uh, and there is kind of a... a final mystery challenge uh that i that i won't spoil for you here but um but i beat that and uh and and got away but but basically as you leave it, it restarts and you are given an upgrade point you can put into something that will make your next run a little bit easier and so like on your first run you're probably not going to complete the kind of final crazy challenge that gives you the cherry so in each game you can get a gold trophy and a cherry. They're like achievements, basically. Um, and so in Pilot Quest, the gold is not that difficult. It just takes a little bit of time. Um, a lot a lot of time. Uh, and the cherry is something that will maybe take you a few runs to get strong enough or resilient enough, I guess, is the actual uh, answer to, to meaningfully take that on. Unless, I mean, there are really... So I, I did it on my second run... You you could do it on your first run if you were absolutely fucking bananas. Um, but you would need to, you, you know, you can only so that there's caps on everything. You can only take like I think at the end of the end game meat cap is twenty five. That's a lot of seconds, but the thing you need to do in the final thing. It will will suck a lot of time away. There are ways to earn more time while you're out in the field, and so that's a way to kind of cheese it a little. I don't know. It's maybe not cheesing it, but it's you know a, to to kind of extend your duration. 
Um, it's 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 a really great concept that I would love to see a full blown sequel to. Something that's just got like this has got weeks and weeks of upgrades, and there's you know like the trees are so deep, and there's so much going on here, and you know the ways you want to spec because there's things once you get the aliens that are working for you, you can devote them to different tasks depending on which resource you need. It's a it's a very straightforward and very simple system, but it's very effective. And as the bones, like it, it's it is a it is it is a fun experience on its own. But now that I have basically wrung everything out of it. I'm like, man, I wish that this had 10 times as much stuff in it because I could play this for months. I could, if, if this, if this open zone, this wild zone was bigger and there were more dungeons and more this, and you had to get the resources in order to go out and do it. And you know, like I, it's something I could see myself spending a ton of time on. Uh, I would love to see. A lot, a lot of these concepts, I, I, I would, could say the similar things about. Like it, you, you, you play it and you go, like, man, I, I would love to see this, this thing expanded upon. I would love to see this concept fleshed out a little bit more, or this game a little less difficult, or, or whatever. But, but UFO Fifty is full of ideas, like fresh, crazy ideas. And mixing up genres in, in, in interesting ways and, and um but also just some fucking good ass video game. Warp tank is game number twenty. Um Warp Tank is you're a you're a tank, you can move left and right, you can shoot straight up, and you can warp, which basically means you launch yourself in the direction of your cannon which usually means you're you're on the floor, you can teleport to the ceiling. And when you're on the ceiling, you shoot down and you know and and so on. But you'll occasionally find diagonal pieces and you can use those to roll on walls. And so when you're on the walls, you're teleporting horizontally back and forth between different parts. Of so it becomes a bit of a puzzle of like how am I going to where do I need to position myself to warp myself to the right spot so that I can move forward. Also, I'm being attacked by like four enemies right now. And so I need to manage that and dodge these bullets that are coming in to get to them and stop them from shooting in the first place. And there's some levels where bombs are going off and there's fire chasing you and all that. Like warp tank is fucking killer. It is so fucking good, man. It feel it looks great. It is a great like retro style to it. Like everything is tiny and intricate in ways that you just oh oh. Um, and warp tank seems fucking massive. Like, I think I've done 10 levels in, and, and so there's an overworld there where you're kind of wheeling around to the different levels going into them. The levels will be like, I don't know, one to five minutes, depending on how you're doing. And I'm sure they get more complicated as you go. But, um, then when you complete a number of levels, the overworld will change in ways that will like, oh, this, this thing raised up and now I can teleport onto that and roll over here and there's more levels over here. And, and so it's kind of this big open area that you're exploring in conjunction with getting to these levels. I warp tank is, uh, warp tank is f awesome. Warp tank is so awesome. Those two games right there. Like I, I feel like I've already like gotten a ton out of this thing. Uh, but UFO 50 kind of keeps delivering. Um, Bushido Ball is a pretty decent Windjammers style Pong game where you're, you know, various samurai and have different attacks and different special moves depending on who, on who you pick. Um, these games, a lot of these games do have multiplayer. As far as I can tell, there are no multiplayer only games in the collection, but there are like... I, think, I want to say like just under half of the games have some form of multiplayer in them, uh, which is cool. There's like a platform fighter where every time you hit the enemy, or, uh, they, they shit out a Sonic the Hedgehog ring and the first character to get five rings wins. Um, and each of those characters has different attacks and different, different, you know, different ways they jump. One of the jumps is just like the character spawns an elevator and starts moving up. It's nuts. Um, 
that is a pretty neat game. But but um, Bushido Ball is cool. Um, gosh, I'm looking at the list of games. I just want to like pick out a few more. Um, Minion Max is a really interesting kind of open world platformer where you can just hold, you hold down on the D-pad and she'll shrink. And so it's you're kind of like a tiny character in a big world, but occasionally you also need to just get big and go somewhere else and and shrink down again. Um, and uh, that's got a lot going on in it too. Uh, there is Mortal, M-O-R-T-O-L, which is like... You go into a level and you've got 20 mans. I think it's 20. I think you start with 20. And this guy can run back and forth and he can jump and then he can turn himself into one of three different things. Um, a bomb that you can use to explode enemies, a block that stays there so, so that you can, you know, jump on it later or a spear uh, that will move you forward. It'll also stick in a wall and you can then jump on so, so once you've once you've made a final decision for your for your current man, a, another one spawns. You lose a guy, and another one spawns, and so you have twenty. There are ways to earn more as you go through the level, um, and so it's this push and pull. It is a it's a very lemmings like setup. Um, I find I I I I feel like it's it is lemmings esque because you're taking these generic guys and and putting them to work in a variety of ways of like, oh, this guy's a block. And now I can jump on that block to get up here or I put this block over these spikes so that I can now traverse this spike pit with the next guy. Um, I've, I've stuck three guys in this wall so that I can jump up the wall, up the wall, up the wall. Um, you know, bombs to kind of clear the way ahead. There is a sequel. There is a mortal two in this collection that I haven't tried yet. Um, it sounds like it's even more class based. It sounds really interesting. Um, but I just haven't gotten there yet. Um, Mortal is 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 a really neat idea. Um, and then there's like Magic Garden, which feels like a mid '80s Namco platformer. Um, there's Kick Club, which feels like a knockoff of Bubble Bobble. Um, but you're a kid with a soccer ball. It's like that. It's like that 16-bit game with the kid with the soccer ball, but also kind of Bubble Bobble. Um, there's a couple of different takes on golf. One that's like kind of a pinball style level design. That's really neat. Uh, there is a spiritual successor to down. Well, that is basically you jumping up over and over again, instead of falling down over and over again. And it's hard as hell and I'm terrible at it. Uh, Let's see. There's Vanger, which is kind of a Metroid esque. It seems like a Metroid like world, um, but sort of like Warp Tank. You can kind of gravity, like you can you can flip in the air and stick to the the floor or the ceiling, and you're running around shooting stuff. That's really good. There's some Lunar Lander style stuff uh, in a game called Campanella, which is you're a tiny little UFO going around. Um, there's just uh, there, there's a like a deck building party simulator called Party House, where each attendee to the party raises the stats in different ways, whether it's popularity or money. But it, but some some house guests are trouble, and if there's too much trouble, the cops show up, and you're getting this money and popularity and using it to expand your house so that it can hold more people. Or buy people that are more valuable to you achieving your goals. And it's got like six different scenarios or I guess five different scenarios in a random uh, scenario. Um, and, and each has different win conditions and different house guests and all this other stuff. It's like a really fascinating strategy game that's like also really charming on top of that. It, it's just, man... There's so many little touches across all 50 games in UFO 50. It just, it seems impossible. You it, like, I understand now why this game disappeared off the map for as long as it did. 
It's like when they announce UFO 50, you're like, oh, we're going to get a bunch of indie devs to make little games. You're like, okay, that sounds like a lot of people will be made. Like that, it almost sounded like, well, they'll get 50 devs and each one will make one game and, and whatever. And that, eh, that probably won't take too long. And you're like, all right. Well, eh. And then it got delayed or just like, you know, like it kind of stopped coming up in conversations, I guess is more, more accurate. And it was, uh, you know, worked on for much longer. Like I said, Spelunky 2 happened in the, in the middle of, of all of this stuff. Um, but that's not how it was made. It was a, a smaller team than that, uh, from the, the sounds of things. Um, all of them working on a, a, a variety of different parts of different games, I guess. And like I said, some of these ideas are games that, you know, you look at and go like, that's really clever. I don't know that that would work as a full fledged game. Like I, I don't feel the same way about every game that I feel about pilot quest of like, Oh, I would, I would play a 40 hour version of it or, um, I guess a, a, a much expanded version of this because you, you could definitely play pilot quest for 40 hours. Um, but a lot of them, you get into them and go like, wow, this is a really crazy idea. Like this idea is fucking bonkers. I can't believe this is a thing. And you're like, and, and some of them you're like, oh, you know, this isn't something I'm necessarily going to play a ton of, but that's, I, this is really neat. I'm like, this is really interesting to see. And then you maybe move on to the next thing. But, um, but that's kind of the cool thing about it is, is there's so much going on game to game. Um, that just, I, 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 you feel, I, I felt maybe, I don't know, maybe you'll feel the same way about it, but like, I felt like, man, this just feels like I, I've, I've seen, I've, I've seen it all. Clearly this is going to be my favorite game. There's, there's, you know, and I've got like eight or nine games left that I haven't played at all. Um, but like, then I'll load something up and, and just be completely taken aback by like what a thing is and just be like oh my god like this I can't believe that this is in here as well oh holy shit like what um there's a pretty good it's not a dual joystick game so all the games are two button games um I, that feels like something that they kind of established as a limitation in terms of just like well this this console only had two buttons on the controller so all our games are going to be two button games and there's a couple of games where they push that to the limit of like, I need to push it to do this and hold the button to do this. And, and it's, it's a little bit too much. Um, but generally speaking, everything controls really well and, and, and is basically what you want. Um, overbold is like an arena, like a top down arena shooter. It's not a dual joystick game. It's, you know, you, you, when you hold down the fire button, it just locks in a direction and um, it's pretty straightforward, except between waves, you can basically say, no, bring me more enemies, because if I, if I do that, then I'll get a higher reward at the end of it. So you're like, no, instead of just like giving me one set of enemies, give me five sets of enemies in the, all, all at once. And I will, you know, reap the benefit from that if I can survive and go and buy a bunch of upgrades and, and, and whatever. And that's pretty cool. Um, that is called, what's that called? That is uh, um, Overbold, I believe is the name of that. There's Onion Delivery, which is like a top-down driving game, not entirely dissimilar to like GTA 1, but also not entirely dissimilar to the Matchbox driving game for the NES, but, but much better and more interesting. Um, and again, a lot of really good little bits of writing here and there and world building. There is also, I, I won't get into it in, in specifics, I suppose, but there is a, there is a hidden thing. Um, and I, I kind of read other people's solutions to this. You, you could go on a real crazy chase that would take you through most of the games looking for these little secret moments and secret areas, trying to find these clues and solve these clues that point you to the next thing, the next game, the next little thing. And there is kind of a hidden game in, interactive experience. There's a hidden thing in there because remember, so, so also there is, there's lore here. 
Uh, the actual developers of the game, you don't really see their names in it once the thing starts. Um, instead, you see the names of the fictional developers behind the company UFO Soft. And, um, and, and there's a, and, and you see the same names in the credits kind of over and over again, like, oh, the developers of, of UFO soft and Gregory milk and all this, you know, all these different people, um, that you're kind of seeing, um, over and over again. And there's a game that kind of addresses like. the nature of UFO soft and what happened to them. And, you know, like they seem like this incredibly popular thing in the eighties and, and, and everything else. And, and there's a really, it's a, it's an interesting little story that gets told, um, as you uncover these little secrets and, and there's probably still more to find. I don't know. I ended up joining the discord for the game just to see people hunting for uh you know whatever the next clues are and uh it seems like maybe most of it's been found by now but i don't i don't know i don't know um it's only available on pc right now uh derek you did say that the game would appear on console at some point down the line which uh seems like it would be a a, a totally perfect fit there um it's like 25 bucks it's uh it's really something else, man. It's really crazy. Like seeing the kind of some of the mishmash of uh, different genres and ideas um, in, in some of these individual games, but also just like the entire collection as a whole. It just feels like this really interesting rumination on great. I just like they came up with a bunch of fucking great ideas. Again, not every single one of those great ideas is turned into an amazing video game. You see some stuff and you go like, okay, I see what you did here. But like, even in those situations, there's like, there are interesting things about it where you go like, oh, wow, that's really weird. That's a really crazy, that's a really crazy, like you go in thinking it's one thing like, oh, I don't know this side-scrolling cowboy shooter is clear and you're like oh what the fuck am i even looking like what um it's uh it's really something special and uh there are enough like really awesome games in here that you know even if you're not someone who's gonna really kind of get off on the, just the idea part of it if you're not gonna look at it and go like whoa what the hell like, you know if, if that if that's if you're not that person I still think there are enough like killer fucking things to do in here um, that it still works on that level as well. So, so yeah, man, UFO 50, it's, um, it's fucking crazy. Yeah. They announced it in 2017 and originally planned it to be released the following year. And here we are, uh, you know, 2024 with it coming out runs great on a steam deck. If you're so equipped, um, yeah, it's uh, it's it's a really amazing thing. I, I, I'm I'm really I'm I'm really kind of taken aback by it. And and, and like I said, I, I still haven't played all of the games, and and so you know, like I still feel like I have more. There's this crazy drifting. It's like Moon Patrol, but you're in a a fucking like a red Ferrari, and you have to drift to keep yourself charged, and it, it's. Just, it's fucking nuts, dude. It's so crazy. Um, you really should get a look at UFO 50. It's really, it's a really wild thing. Um, and, uh, fucking hats off to him for, for just the, the level of quality, the, the, the joy, the surprise, whatever, you know, like, like all of the stuff that is, is packed into this. It's just, it's really, it's really something special. Um, you know what? Let's, uh, we'll, let's, t let's take our final break of the broadcast and then I will come back and we will, we will get into the rest of the show. Uh, hold tight. We'll be back in a couple minutes. Hey, loss. It's a common thing. A lot of different options at your disposal, but Hey, the only thing worse than losing it is waiting forever for it to grow back. But with hymns, 
you can start seeing your hair grow back in as little as three to six months. Imps provides access to a range of hair loss treatments that work all from the comfort of your couch. That makes treating hair loss simple with doctor-trusted treatment options and clinically proven ingredients like finasteride and minoxidil that can regrow hair in as little as three to six months. They offer personal, chewable, oral spray and serum treatment options so you can find what works best for you. And the process is simple. It's also 100% online. You answer a few questions and a medical provider will determine if treatment is right for you. If you're prescribed, your treatment is sent directly to your door. Ames has hundreds of thousands of trusted subscribers. So if you feel like you're losing a part of yourself with your hair loss, get Hims and get your confidence back. Start your free online visit today at Hims.com slash Jeff. That's H-I-M-S dot com slash Jeff for your personalized hair loss treatment options. Hims.com slash Jeff. Results vary. Based on studies of topical and oral minoxidil, prescription products require an online consultation with a healthcare provider who will determine if a prescription is appropriate. Restrictions apply. See website for full details and important safety information. I also played a little game called Yars Rising uh, this week. I was not expecting so this this is this Atari published this this is the it's in the lineage of Yars Revenge the original Atari 2600 game but uh at the outset when you look at it you're like I what a, like what does this have to do with that it is a uh um a search action game with a vague kind of modern anime-ish sort of style. Amer American anime. Can we, is that a thing yet? Can we go like, yeah, you know, it's like, it's, it's like an animation style. That's like, they like anime, but it's not, they're not. Mm, eh. Maybe I'm just mislabeling it completely. Um, but it is a fucking fascinating video game. So yeah, it is a search action game. You're you're going in, you're you're jumping and crawling through air ducts and doing all this stuff. You're playing as a programmer, uh, a a girl who uh, goes by the handle of Yar. Um, and so the the ties to the like the storyline ties to the original Yar's Revenge is maybe a, a little weird. Um, but but there's something there. And she is working at this crazy tech company. She wants to break into their server room and hack them to steal something. I don't know. And she's like, ah, I'll probably get caught, but let's go and do it. So the opening of the game is you, you know, tutorializing your way to the, the objective and then immediately getting caught and then hacking a computer that gives you the ability to shoot energy out of your arm. The hacking mini game in Yars Rising is Yar's Revenge. Um, and a bunch of different takes on Yar's Revenge. A bunch of different like, okay, you're going to play Yar's Revenge here, but it's a bunch of, but it's like centipede style enemies coming at you instead of, instead of like going over there and smashing the Cotiel, uh, as, as we are wont to do as Yar's Revenge players. Um, and so they've coded in all of these different Yars Revenge style mini games and placed them at every single little computer terminal across the game. There's a separate menu off the main menu where you can go and play them again and earn trophies in them and, and, and all this other stuff because they've seemed to have made like a hundred different variants of fucking Yars Revenge in the middle of all this stuff, which is super weird, but like legit fucking awesome. Like, it's a really crazy, like, I don't like, well, all right. Like, on paper, this is terrible. On paper, you're, on paper, you're like, you're shit in my mouth and calling it a Sunday, man. But it's, uh, it, it's really neat. Um, the, the, like, search action aspects of it, uh, you know, you're, you're getting the ability to make your way through different types of doors and you're hacking to open other doors and you're shooting enemies and, and doing all of that. And that stuff is pretty good. Um, the handling on it is, is okay. It's got a like hide in the background mechanic in case, you know, cause there's some robots that 
you know, you're not strong enough to fight at the beginning of the game. I assume you eventually upgrade to a point where you can take them on. Um, but they do a little bit of stealth at the outset uh, for you. Um, and you're also equipping different upgrades and you have a limited uh, amount of room to put those upgrades on. The upgrade system is like a bunch of, it's like a Tetris style. Like the, the upgrades will be like, this is an L shaped upgrade and, and your, your little blocky pixel representation of the main ship from Yar's Revenge here only has this many blocks in it. So you have to figure out where to put it and move this around. And, and so as you get more upgrades, you'll have to kind of balance uh, that um, as, as you go. Uh, this came out I, almost like a month ago. I, I, maybe it was earlier this month, um, but this has been out for at least a couple of weeks. And um, like I said, just, you know, I, I feel like a lot of the stuff that has had WayForward's name on it over the last handful of years, I have not enjoyed at all. Or it's been like, ah, oh, you know, okay, this is this is almost cool, but maybe not. Or, you know, there, there's been a, a couple of things. They do River City Girls. Was that them? I was going to say that might be the one way forward thing that I liked, but I can't remember if they actually made that or not. But um, but I feel like the way forward name is maybe not the, the hit factory that people thought it was going to be there when they were first uh, doing their thing. Um. And so they've, they've been putting out some, I was going to say some pretty uneven stuff, but actually it's just not great. They've been putting out a bunch of stuff that I've completely been bouncing off of. This is neat. Uh, this is a really cool concept. And it, it ends up being, because like, okay, making a new Yars Revenge is a fucking terrible idea. It's such a simple, straightforward game um, that anything you do to it to like elaborate it into something that's like a 10 hour epic or, or you know, or whatever. It's just not going to it's, it's you, the concept as much as I love Yars Revenge and I, I do. I, I fucking love Yars Revenge. Um. It's just not something you can expand upon. And they tried. They did a terrible fucking rail shooter uh, for the PS3 that I think you can play if you're on whatever tier of PS Plus lets you stream PS3 games. The Yars Revenge game, I think, is there. I know the, the, I know the bad Star Raiders game is there. Um, but I think the Yars game is as well. But anyway, it was a downloadable PS3 game. And it just sucked. I mean, it was just like, here's this super generic thing that you're like, all right, you're kind of riffing on the Yars Revenge stuff a little bit, but really you've just made kind of a bad rail shooter and who the fuck cares? Like, this is not Yars Revenge. Th this, Yars Rising, is such a completely different thing that you're almost like angry at first. Like, why would they even name it Yar's Revenge? They're shitting, you know, they're, 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 the legacy of Yar's Revenge is, needs to be pure. What the fuck are these people doing? But you're like, oh, actually, huh. Like, they're using Yar's Revenge as an idea, as a, as a, as a mini game inside of this larger thing. The, the, the Metroidvania that it is, is, is like, seems pretty decent, at least from the, the, the bit that I've played so far. And so it actually, in some ways is kind of, I, I look at it and go like, man, in, in a lot of ways, this is maybe the only way to do this because Yar's Revenge is such a, you know, because in so many of these old 2600 games, I feel the same way about of just like, you know, I, I like that Spider-Man game that came out on the 2600. He climbs a building and there are bombs and it's good for what it is. But are you going to make a game now that it evokes, are you going to make a new Spider-Man game? That's just like, yo man, you climb a building and there are bombs. Like it would eat shit. It would fucking suck. Maybe Spider-Man's a weird example. Cause obviously there Spider-Man is a much larger character than that. Whereas Yara's revenge is like, that's kind of it. You got the comic book that came with it. And here you go. And so getting bits and pieces and little tastes of Yars Revenge style gameplay in the mini games and also seeing the riffs that they came up with on that gameplay 
uh, because Yar's Revenge is a very basic thing, but they came up with a you know a ton of different ways to look at it and play it, and you know that that all kind of use that similar graphical style and whatever else. Like I, it is. Whoever came up with that idea, whoever whoever said, "Hey, man, no, we're gonna make it. We're gonna make this we're, this girl and this all. This is gonna be a fucking Yar's Revenge game." Whoever said that and was looked at like, "What the fuck is wrong with you?" And then they saw it through. Like the the game is, it, you know, I'm not saying that this game is like some world beating amazing, but like it's masterful in that one specific way. Where you're like, wow, you managed to thread the needle on this thing and make me really want to see the rest of this. And also go like, you know, it really feels like these guys like Yar's Revenge. Sometimes that's all you want is to feel like, hey, the people that made this thing like the thing that I like. And also they knew a way to approach it that didn't result in them shitting all over the thing that we claim to like. Um, And so that's neat. I don't know. Yar's Rising. I, again, I'm really surprised by it i i i was not expecting it to do this as well as it does but they pull it off and um and, and i want and and i even i'm like interested in the characters on their own merits and whatever else like the, the little bit of story that there's been so far and i and i maybe i'm like an hour and a half in or something like that um seeing some of the upgrades and seeing some of the things that you get and everything i'm like you know what this is this is fucking really neat and now I, I want to see that thing through. Um, and so, yeah, I don't like more power to them, man. They, this is if Atari, cause Atari has been, I feel like not like Atari has been missing the mark with their remakes of old games. All of this, like missile command recharged and gravitar, whatever's and, you know, all of the stuff that they're doing to kind of reissue or, or make new versions of their old games, the super sprint game they did a little bit ago. They are, they are games that make you go, man, I should just go play the actual thing. I like instead of this worst thing, instead of this, like we made fancy neon graphics for this old game and we added questionable power-ups to it and it's like it's the thing you like right and you're like no this is not no no you've in most cases butchered the feel of it and in some cases you know some of those games started as mobile games and so they were monetized a specific way and, and whatever else and like i i feel like a lot of the stuff atari has been doing in terms of actual game releases has not been great um, from the, on the business side, they've been kind of killing it, you know, like, oh, they're, they acquired digital Eclipse. They, you know, they've been selling weird merchandise. Now they're, they just started taking pre-orders for fucking hot sauce, which is maybe a bridge too far. Um, but like by and large, they, they've, they've at least been like laying the groundwork for that company to be not a joke, um, anymore. And, uh, but the, the catch was that I think a lot of the, the releases, uh, specifically the releases they've been doing of their back catalog, that stuff has not worked very well. Atari 50 notwithstanding, because that's just emulations of the actual games you care about and want to play, which that's getting DLC pretty soon. We talked about that a while back. I think the, the games that are going to be part of that DLC are going to get announced this week. Um, I hot the, the idea of Atari branded hot sauce is is very stupid. Um and sure. But but also why not? I don't know. Like I feel like if I wanted my own hot sauce, there's like there are so many places that will just let you put a sticker on a hot sauce bottle if you want to sell custom custom quote unquote hot sauces. Um that you could you could probably do that. Maybe that's maybe I need to get into the hot sauce game. You know? Billy Mitchell's court case doesn't sound like it's going great, so someone's gotta step up. Maybe that's what Atari's try to do. They look at it and go like, Yeah, you know, Billy's on the ropes. <laughs> We've got a there's an opening. There's an opening for a video game hot sauce and we're gonna we're gonna make it happen. What would I even call a hot sauce? I don't even know. I don't, I don't, just, that's not. Um, 
big day for fighting games right now. Big day today. Uh, or I guess la starting last night. But big week, maybe? Um, Terry Bogard has been released into Street Fighter VI. As of last night, I have not had time to try it. Um, and also, the expansion for Mortal Kombat 1 is out today. Uh, which oh, they did not give early access to, but they did. They sent they sent it out. They said like, hey, it's not going to work until until eight a.m. on the twenty fourth. And so the, the like clockwork, the patch downloaded at eight a.m. and I launched it and watched the little introductory cutscene, and then played one versus match as Cyrax, and kind of nodded my head and went, hmm, okay, hmm, all right, all right, uh. I, the the story hook for Chaos Reigns for for this expansion is that there is a crazy damaging like dangerous titanic version of the character Havoc. Havoc with an eye. He's the guy that twists his head around and he's the, he's like a skeleton bone man or you know he's like a zombie. I don't know what the fuck he is. Revenant, whatever. Um I appreciate that Mortal Kombat 1 is all about um, multiverse stuff and all these cool, you know, different, you know, like, the, I, I, I thought the story in Mortal Kombat 1 was really fun and crazy and uh, was a really good time. But the selling point of, like, Havoc is here and he's pissed is not doing it. Like, oh, congratulations, one of the one of like Havoc should have a fucking joke Tumblr account where he posts about not being able to eat much like Shu Hao and, and P Jack from the Tekken series uh, do. Havoc should have a fucking fake Tumblr account where he talks about how fucking under under loved he is or, or whatever. Um, He's that he's that tier. He's that tier of character. And it's fun that they brought him back for Mortal Kombat 1, but not that fun. And not that fun that he is being presented as the main big bad guy in this expansion. I'm sure the expansion goes a lot of places. I haven't touched it at all yet. But I will just say from the outset, that is not a great selling point of like, ooh, what's Havoc gonna do? The fuck is Havoc up to? No. Shu Hao would have been a better choice. The Black Dragon, you know, do a whole Black Dragon thing. Um. All right, why don't we, why don't we get into the news? This seems like something that was. Um, Maybe not supposed to be posted. I, in fact, I guess Eurogamer is reporting that it has uh, been deleted. But uh, this was something that was, I guess, originally supposed to run in the this afternoon's PlayStation State of Play broadcast, where they're going to spend about 30 minutes talking around 20 games or so. Um, this was, or this, I, I think, will be one of them. It is Legacy of Kane Soul Reaver 1 and 2 Remastered. Um... But it popped up on the PlayStation Store long enough for people to grab the trailer and, and whatever else. Um, Aspire is doing it. It is out December 10th. This is not a, a particularly well-kept secret. Um, it will, they will have original graphics and remastered graphics. And people loved those Soul Reaver games. Um... The Soul Reaver games are like, what if the Shadow Man games were actually good? I don't mean that in like a shitty way. I mean like Shadow Man fucking sucks, but it's because Soul Reaver was right there. You know? Um, and uh, I like Blood Omen Legacy of Cain, the original, the game that started it all. Dennis Diax, Magnum Opus. Um, and, uh, yeah, so this, that game was, that game was like, if the legend of Zelda was a game where you were a vampire 
And then you could drink a lot of blood, and then he would say, Favictus! over and over again, and it was very exciting. Um, and so, I don't know, when the Soul Reaver games came out, I think there was a part of me that was very much stuck on the original game, and like, man, I wish that they had iterated on that instead of this kind of third-person action-adventure sort of thing that they made. Um... And they made these for a while and then just stopped. I don't know. You know, I, I think they kind of petered out. These were the two, right? I mean, the, the Soul Reaver games. And then what, after that, it was like they actually did a... Did they do a Blood Omen 2 at that point? But it wasn't... It was not... It did, they did not go back to the original Blood Omen. It was more just like, ah, eh, you play as Kane, but it's just... It's the Soul Reaver engine. You're like, okay, this is not great. Um, but... Uh, People loved those Soul Reaver games back then, so I'm sure that there are plenty of people who are fucking stoked uh, that these will come back in some way, shape, or form, uh, even if it is Aspire, which I feel like Aspire maybe not the greatest track record in remasters these days, or ever. Um, but, what are you gonna do? Uh... PlayStation has announced their 30th anniversary console and hardware lineup. This is going to be a batch of limited edition gear that will come in the original PS1 gray. That's right. We are going to line up online in order to get gray consoles. Drab gray. PS1 gray. We're all nostalgic for it and we love it and I love it. But also, let's take a step back here. It's just this medium, middle-ass gray. But they do have the original color, uh, the PlayStation logo with the coloring on it and, and, and everything. And um, It's going to be a variety of gear. The base PS5 will be part of this lineup. They have not announced pricing, though some details leaked implying that the, the PlayStation 5, the, the non-pro, regular-ass PlayStation 5, in the 30th anniversary trim would be an extra 50 bucks, which would, I guess, make it $500 uh, because it does not come with a disk, disk drive. Um, though I believe uh, they, it looks like they are going to provide a gray disk drive shell in case you do want to add one on. So you will not have to have just a weird white drive hanging off of it. Um, the uh, they are going to do a regular dual sense controller, and it sounds like the pricing for that is in line with other limited edition controllers, like the um, like the Astrobot controller that just came out. Which what was that? Was it like eighty five? Was that what that was? I forget what the price was, but uh, the other prices have not leaked. They are going to do a dual sense edge in this trim, which that controller is already two hundred dollars. Um, and I believe that is going to be sold separately, but they are also going to do a highly limited number of PlayStation 5 Pros. 12,300 to be exact. That is the number they are allocating for the entire world. Pricing has not been revealed for this. Uh, there are scalpers out there already fucking trying to say, hey, if I get one of these and you want it, it's going to be like 10 grand. Uh, which seems like a, that seems like a bit of a pipe dream. I don't know. The idea of getting $10,000 for one of these seems ridiculous to me. Um, they, um, they are going to pack a dual sense edge in with this console. So already if we forget any markup for the color scheme or 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 other that or all that other stuff it is going to come with the $200 controller instead of the like 80 or $70 controller so i would assume baseline we're talking 850 it also is going to come with a stand that's right you won't have to buy the stand separately um and so I, i'm just i'm going to guess that they're not going to give anybody a price break on this and be like and we're going to throw in the stand for free. Uh, this also does not come with a disk drive, so you will have to provide your own if that's something you want to do. 
And uh, plenty of people have spent a lot of time writing YouTube comments on the video that Sony used to announce these things. Um, to make light of the fact that they are making a thing meant to honor the PlayStation's legacy all the way back to the PlayStation 1, and they are selling it in a digital-only capacity. I, you know, I get what they're saying. Also, eh. Um. But especially because it does look like that they are going to include a, a gray shell for the disk drive should you want to buy one. They look cool, much like they did with the 25th uh, anniversary consoles and the 20th anniversary consoles. Um, they're doing weird trim and, you know, PlayStation lettering and the PlayStation symbols will be engraved onto various parts of the plastic. Uh, they've got a new version of that, that for the 30th anniversary. Um, I have the, I guess it's the 20th anniversary PS4 Pro, which is like the translucent blue. And that's, yeah, that's a numbered edition as well. Um, I have one of those. It was nice. It's nice. I don't know. It's a PlayStation. It sits under your TV. You barely even look at it. Um, as someone who is going to continue covering video games for the foreseeable future, I do feel like it is in my best interest to have a PlayStation 5 Pro. Um, and so, as, because I'm a, a sicko, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm going to at least try to pre-order one of these gray ones, just out of curiosity. Because if I'm going to get one, I might as well get the fucking fancy one, I guess. Unless it's like insane. I mean, I don't know. What are they going to charge for it? Like, what could they, like, what, what would they possibly, uh, they're selling on a PlayStation Direct on their own website. In regions where they do not have PlayStation Direct, I guess they will be taking pre-orders at retailers. $1,200 and $1,230 would be a funny, yeah. Ugh. Some people guessing $1,100. I could see it. I don't think that's a good, I think that's insane. I think that's like, because $700 is already um, a stupid amount of money for a console. Uh, limited editions and limited colorways and, and all of that other shit, you know, you, you, you know, kind of all bets are off, but also they're packing in an edge. So that's another $100 and change in controller value right out of the gate. Um, this is like buying a Neo Geo or something. Uh, but yeah, if they're including a stand and a charger, like whatever else, like, yeah, they're, they're, they're throwing in a lot of stuff that a regular PS5 Pro wouldn't have. And I, again, I expect them to pass the price right along to you. They're not going to, they're not going to be like, for our number one fans who are here for the 30th anniversary, the, it's just going to be $700. Yay. And you get a dual sense edge with it. Isn't that cool? We love you guys. No, they're going to be like, dog, this is $1,200. Go fuck yourself. You know, or, or whatever they end up doing. Um, I like the dual sense edge. I like the gray color on it. Um, and so that's a nice looking controller. It also comes with a PlayStation shaped paper clip and a, you know, a sticker and some, you know, some cable wraps and, um, some other, some other things like that, that they're kind of throwing in the box that in, in the video they made, they, because they had the time, they stopped to show every little bit of one of those things and go like, look at this. You're like, okay. Um, but yeah, you know, they're throwing in a charging station. They're throwing, oh, they're also going to do the, the PlayStation portal, the, the remote play thing. They're going to do one of those in gray. Okay, I don't know. <laughs> um, whatever. I, some, people's, some people really like their PlayStation Portal. I can't imagine buying one of those devices instead of just like, let me get a controller shell for my phone or let me use a Steam Deck or let me use any other device that can do this but also do something else. The idea of a $200 device that all it does is remote play PlayStation games 
even if it was like, hey, you can sideload an Xbox thing on here and you can you can stream your Xbox games too. Even that would be something. But like the idea of just like a standalone device that like that would sit on a fucking shelf, man. Um, I can use my Steam Deck for that. Buy a Steam Deck. I got one of the translucent limited edition Steam Deck OLEDs. Why wouldn't you know? Then you'd be playing UFO 50 or something. Um, but hey, uh, I, you know, they're nice looking devices. I, you know, the, the nostalgia, you kind of have to, you know, there, there is, you know, there, there is certainly a pull there. I get it. Uh, I get it. I feel it, you know, um, even if I do think it's, it's, it's funny that we are all nostalgic for like this particular shade of gray. <laughs> Like, hey, we made this thing look like drab. I'm like, okay, that's cool because the original PlayStation looked kind of drab, but in an awesome way. God damn it! Now, I don't know. I I love the the look of the original PlayStation. So, so I don't know. Can't fault it. It would have been fun if they had done a PS2 styled one and put some fins on the front of it. You know, and like like kind of something a little bit closer to that. I don't know. What's like? What's the best looking? I have two questions. What's the best looking PlayStation? It's it's the probably the or just the original PS2, right? The Slims are cool, but they just look like the Slims look the 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 measurements on the Slim always just looked weird to me. If it had just looked the exact same dimensions as a base PS2 but smaller, that would have been cool. I think the Slims look kind of cheap. They look like the DVD player you got at the gas station. Um, yeah, the PS1 with the built-in on built -in screen. I love the look of that thing. I got one of those and put a mod chip in it and got the screen. And I remember when I moved out, I was using that as a CD player. I remember listening to... Uh, what? Artif artificial... The, 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 the De La Soul album that came out around the same time. Or... or Around the same time as I moved, I guess, not the same time as the PS1, but we're listening to that CD in the PS1 because I hadn't moved all of my stuff yet. Um, I have a translucent, a skeleton blue PS2 uh, that I imported from Japan, um, and I think that's an amazing, an amazing looking console. Uh, the PS2s, they, they, they did, it was the slim PS2s they did with car paint, right? They did a highly limited number of PS2 slims that were like car colors with like that style of paint on them. And those looked really fucking neat. Uh, I guess my next question is like, so this has been more in, in the kind of, as I've been thinking about the nature of the PlayStation 5 and the nature of console games, What's the best PlayStation? Like, what's the best generation of PlayStation? It's, it's an easy answer. It's not a, yeah, it's not a hard answer. It's the PlayStation 2. And then after that, it is maybe either the 1 or the 4. But I guess, like, what I'm getting at here is it's, um, you know, we're, we're still in the middle of it and there's still more games to come and Sony's going to announce more things later today that one of the things that someone told me that was going to be on that show, if that is something that they announce here, I am... Sorry. Uh, man. Um... The PlayStation 5 is probably the second worst. At, at best, it is probably going to go down as the second worst PlayStation generation. And that, you know, that probably... There are going to be some people that feel really strongly about the PlayStation 3 
that might actually say the PS5 is the actual worst. And some people in chat are saying it right now. I don't know, man. I the the PS3 There are some great games on the PlayStation 3, but I think there are also some great games on the PlayStation 5. They're just multi-platform. You know? Um I, yeah, sure. Yeah, the PS3 at least it's got that fucking at least it's got MGS4, which is an amazing video game, a ridiculous video game. The PS3 controller was bad. It was bad for shooters at a time when shooters were rising to become the dominant art form in all of culture everywhere. Uh, the Dual Shock Three triggers are dog shit, and uh, that that cost them, I think, in some ways. And the architecture and everything else. We don't need to relitigate the entirety of the PlayStation 3, but but actually as people are fighting for the PS3 and a lot of the experimental games that came out on the PS3 and uh and and the first party output and, and all that other stuff. You are maybe convincing me that it that the PS3 is actually the second worst PlayStation generation. Um, that it doesn't feel good. Like I don't, I don't, you know, I'm not like over here like clowning on it, going, "Ha ha!" The LOL, the PS5, the uh, you know, it, it's a bummer. As someone who is 48 hours away from attempting to spend fucking five thousand dollars or whatever they're going to charge for these fucking PS5 Pros, as someone who has loved the fucking what Sony has done to the video game industry by and large. They shook things up at a time when it needed it. Um, I think Sony has, you know, if, you, if we look at their involvement in video games since the launch of the PlayStation, I'm not going to count any of the Sony image soft fucking hook for the Sega CD ass bullshit. CNC power factory, maybe. Um, I think they've they've been a very positive force in video games over the last 30, 30 years. So I was like looking at a calendar going like, how long has it been? Like, oh, right, 30. The whole reason we're talking about this is because it's been 30 years. Um, but, you know, I, but also I, the things that are happening to the video game industry are not necessarily lying at the feet of PlayStation, I think. You know, obviously, Xbox has had its share of challenges and its its own challenging generation of hardware, uh, or I guess software support for said hardware is the is the what I actually mean there. Um, so, happy thirtieth birthday! I mean, we're still a few months away. It's it's December. Of 94 was when the PlayStation launched in Japan. So, um, but 30 years of PlayStation. Yep. I still remember when someone came to me and said, Hey man, Sony mean, means business. They're actually, you know, because everyone knew that Sony was trying to get in and, and the PlayStation name had been thrown around about at that point. But, you know, we were coming off of the 3DO and all this other shit where you're just like, or the, the CDI. And so you're like, what do these consumer electronics companies know about fucking video games? Jack shit. Tell Phillips I said to get fucked. Tell Panasonic I said to get fucked. And so when Sony was getting in, it was just like, all right, man. More dog shit, I guess. More fucking multimedia. And you're like, someone goes like, hey, actually... You know, just so you know, uh, the the PS One, you know, not not necessarily in a, in a correcting me kind of way because well, that wasn't, but it was this like, hey, so I've I've talked to the people that have gone to Sony to to run this project in the U.S. I've seen, you know, and like they are fucking extremely serious about this. Like they've got the goods, like the hardware they've got, like they're 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 gonna fucking do some shit. And you're still like, okay, well, I don't know, man. Nintendo and Sega are are doing some shit. I don't know. What what do we, you know? Um, but of course, you know, whatever. The, we've stole the story on Game Boys to Men multiple times. Um, 
but the the launch of the original PlayStation or the the run up to the launch of the original PlayStation was a fucking mind blowing time in video games, uh, largely because of the shit Sony was doing and when with the hardware that they had and the games they had for that hardware and just how good looking and cool some of that stuff was. I'm talking about Toshinden over here, motherfucker. A quality goddamn video game. Um, Nintendo finally pulled the trigger on a lawsuit against Pocket Pair, the developer uh, behind PAL World. Uh, but it's not the lawsuit that you thought it was going to be. It is a patent lawsuit. Uh, and they are claiming um, that the, let's see here, uh, on the grounds that Power World, a game developed and released by the defendant, infringes multiple patent rights. Nintendo will continue to take necessary actions against any infringement of its IP rights, including the Nintendo brand itself, to protect the IP it has worked hard to establish over the years. This was all filed in, in Tokyo, so, you know, there's, um, you know, there's, there's obviously the laws there are different here, there than here and, and what have you, but, but this is, uh, this is happening, but, it, but it's not as simple as like, yo man, you kind of made a Pokemon patent rights. Sounds like they're going to say like, yo man, you made a game where monsters get trapped in a ball. And then are let out to fight like like they're going to. It's going to end up being a very narrow. It's not going to be the entirety of the game. It's going to be like, hey, these five things in this game. Fuck you. And. Yeah. Um, because I do. They, they I do believe they have a patent on this stuff. Um, I don't know anything about where this will go or how it will go because it's all Japanese law and. I'm not even an American lawyer. Um, but yeah, it's not a copyright case. This uh, Video Games Chronicle talked to a lawyer about this earlier in the year. They have some quotes in their story saying that like for a copyright case, they would need to prove copying, not just taking influence. Copyright and like that sort of stuff is much harder to prove. Um... And that goes back decades and decades of, you know, kind of gaming related litigation. Um, the Pokemon company did say back when it all came out, they're like, hey, we're, we're looking at it. We're aware of it. Don't worry. Because a lot of fans were like, you guys need to sue. This. Like, it was like people were just being shitty. They're like, you should sue these fucking brigands. I'm like, okay. Sure. Like, are you guys the cops? Like, what the fuck is, what are we doing? Um, and so, yeah, this is, uh, you know, they say, hey, we will take appropriate action against those that infringe on our intellectual property rights. And so it took them some time to do it, um, whether it was something that was just an opportune time for them because, you know, TGS is right around the corner and. You know, yeah, that, that game was scheduled to come to PS5 in the relatively nearish future here, and maybe that would give it a higher profile in Japan. And so that's why they're trying to head it off in Japanese courts. Um, because it being on PC and Xbox is, you know, it's like, oh, well, no one, no one owns an Xbox here, so who cares? Uh, and, you know, the PC is what it is. I'll be curious to see what Nintendo actually puts forth in terms of just like, hey, here are the very key moments or the key things that this game does that will uh, that will lead to them prevailing on a patent case. Uh, but, you know, there's a reason why they didn't pursue a copyright case because, you know, they probably wouldn't win that. Uh... Kotaku has a story about Concord. Um, if you have forgotten, Concord is the 5v5 first person shooter that uh, was launched on PlayStation and PC. And then after a couple of weeks, Sony 
took the rare step of taking the servers down and refunding everyone who bought it and basically acting like the game doesn't didn't ever exist um i have some videos up of it if you want to get familiar with what conquered was um kotaku's story is that the director of the game has stepped down uh ryan ellis who you may have seen his name on a playstation blog post or two over the you know time of of Concord's development um he is not leaving the studio but he is going to move into more of a support role uh that is according to three sources that spoke with Kotaku about it um and they have some quotes here you know that are just it's it's a fucking bummer Quotes here from from some former developers uh, saying Ryan deeply believed in that project and bringing players together through the joy in it. Uh, said one former developer who said he felt Ellis had poured a great deal of himself into the game, leading to a ton of stress. Regardless of there being things that could have been done differently throughout development, he's a good human and full of heart. Um, they have not said what is going to happen with uh, with Concord as of this time. Even to the people who are still working at Firewalk, the studio that developed it, uh, Concord goes, or, uh, Kotaku goes on to say it is not clear what comes next uh, and that the sources that they spoke to are pessimistic that Concord will return and that some have been asked to explore pitches for something completely different that Firewalk, which is currently around 150 to 170 employees, might work on next. Speculation among some staff has also included whether the studio could be used as co-development on one of Sony's other first-party projects, cur projects currently in production. Others, however, feel like mass layoffs will be the mo most likely result of Conquer's failure, including the possible shutdown of the entire studio. Which sources tell Kotaku is one of the more expensive studios in the PlayStation portfolio on a per-head basis. Yikes. Um... And that some are leaving the studio already and getting their resumes ready, and some are waiting to see what a severance package might look like should the studio get shut down. So it sounds like that Sony is not necessarily has not necessarily figured out what to do with Firewalk, whether it's give them another crack at it or you're like you know they're going to let them pitch from the sounds of it if they're at least like putting together stuff for something completely unrelated. But none of those things sound like conquered returning and i am where are they located i believe they're located in seattle the seattle area which is not a cheap place to run a studio um it's it's hard to imagine a scenario where this game comes back in any way shape or form because this game was in development for a very, very long time. Um, I mean, you know, whatever. Not, I mean, about as long as UFO 50, maybe. I don't know. Maybe a little bit less time. Depending on what you consider to be active development um, and not just pre-production, coming up with ideas or whatever. But from the sounds of things and hearing about, you know, what the game maybe looked like a few years back and, you know, kind of just as it was working its way through It sounds like a game where they were never quite sure what they wanted to make and they had to enter production without really having that stuff down and having that stuff like, here's exactly what we're making. And by the time, you know, you, you have to assume at some point Sony comes to them and says, hey, I don't know if you've been listening to what our head guy has been saying um, in all these interviews lately and all these financial calls, but... He sure does keep saying that a lot of money is being wasted. So you guys need to fucking get it together and fucking get something out the fucking door. You're kind of out of time. And is this the thing that they could come up with in the time they had remaining? Or they're like, uh, all right, well, maybe we'll, I mean, you know, we, we want to do an extraction shooter mode or we want to do this or we experimented with this and none of it's come together, but maybe it will after launch. We'll launch with this and our cutscenes. We can do this. We know we can do this. We know we can get this done by this date and support it. 
and then that'll give us time to evolve it into the game we actually want to make, which is not this, or you know, or or was this exactly? Did they eventually all hit agreement of just like, nope, this is what we're making, five v five shooter, and it's going to have sick cutscenes. You're like, oh, that seems unlikely to me, but but they burned through a lot of money getting there, <coughs> and um. And and yeah, it, it sounds like that they spent a long time figuring out what the heck it was they were going to make. That's why the number about like, oh, this game was in development for eight years or whatever. I was like, no, no, it wasn't. It was a game with this name. Were they, were they figuring it out for the first four years or something like that? Because they were starting up the studio and they were under probably Monsters, which is Harold Ryan's, I don't know, incubation platform, whatever it is, whatever probably Monsters actually is. Um, for the first handful of those years before Sony came in and bought them. I mean, yeah, that game was, was all over the place from the sounds of things. And so, um, so it's always funny to see people go like, oh, they spent six years, eight years or whatever. And, and working on a five V five competitive shooter, like, no, well, no. They made a shooter, they made assets, they came up with a universe, they figured out Unreal Engine 5 along the way. They, you know, they they did a ton of work on a variety of things that ended up not making the grade for one reason or another. I bet that there's like I bet that with Conquered, there's more on the cutting room floor. Not not fully finished things, obviously. And and maybe this is a, a no brainer. Maybe every game is is truly like this, and I'm you know it's, it's kind of pointless. But like, I bet there are more ideas that were thrown away than than ideas that made it into the final shipping game. It's not a case of just like oh we had to cut these three things at the end. It's like no we no, we had a. I, I bet it's a case where they had a whole lot that they tried for a while and didn't find the fun and cut it and made this instead and. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, we could speculate about that for the rest of our lives and, uh, let's not. Um, but again, the, the point being, I, 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 it's impossible for me to see a world where Concord comes back because what are you bringing back? Like, this is the, like, what are you going to change in that game? What would you put in it? That would be like, Oh, now it's, now it's completely bad. Now it's amazing. Like, what would you have? You could turn around in, what, six months? Like, 18 months max, right? I mean, there's no, like, what would you put in that thing that you could do quickly that they would not have done already? You know what I mean? Making it free to play is not the answer. That game would not have survived as a free-to-play game. Would it have made it three months instead of two weeks? Sure. But things are just as brutal for free-to-play out there, if not more so. So the the idea that like, oh, if, if you could buy skins for the mushroom guy on day one and download the game for free, that would have been it. Everyone would have loved it. Like, no, dude. Like, the game was not great. Um... And so the, the that would have not yeah the, a, going free to play will not will not change that game's fate. It will just stretch it out a little bit. Um, Justin in the chat says, "I still do not understand why Factions was canceled and this wasn't. The Last of Us already has a decade long history that resonates with gamers. It's because the people that would have had to make and support Factions." were people that would probably make more money for the company making another game, whether that's last of us three or like, do you want to take one of your premier studios, a studio that is not outfitted for maintaining a live game for five years, seven years, whatever do you want to take them and lock them up with that. All the people that you have in the cinematics department are just going to like what? Like sit on their hands and go like, I don't know. Eventually we're going to make another single player game. And I guess I'm just going to sit here and fucking whack off. You know, like 
No, all those people leave. Like that, that would that would change fundamentally change the face of that studio, or they would have to grow in such a way that they would have to build an entirely separate team to support that game. And then the, do they want to manage that team or does Naughty Dog want to just keep making their fucking thing? You know, like, uh, I think that the people that stepped in, whether it was people at the Naughty Dog level or people kind of externally or, or both or, or whatever, that probably looked at the opportunity and looked at how much it would cost them in terms of people and, and what, what that studio would have to turn into and the head count needs they would have and like if they didn't have the passion for it, if they didn't have, the, you know, like if it would really make too many dramatic changes to that, then no, don't do it. Just don't fucking do it. It's a, that would be a, that'd be a bad idea to go forward on that if they're not like, you know, all in on it. It's kind of the problem with a lot of the live service stuff or, the, or you know, just kind of these, these games in general that are going to be like, hey, we're going to launch a big multiplayer game. And we're going to serve an audience that that expects regular updates and, and whatever else is like you have to be fucking pot committed to that shit for a chunk of time to figure it all out because and, and you know I, I think Sony just kind of showed that they weren't with pulling the plug on Concord as, as fast as they did. How did they not know that like what why did they launch it at all is maybe the better question to ask in this scenario. Like you had to know you probably did some focus testing. You probably put it in front of some people, whether it was some mock reviews, whatever you got, you probably put it in front of enough people that you at least had a feeling of like, this is not going to be the leading IP. And this is not going to be the thing that's going to be the face of PlayStation for the next decade. Like this is not the, this, this ain't gonna, Hmm this is not going to happen the way that people seem to think it's going to happen. I don't know. And yeah, did, 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 uh, did Jim Ryan's, uh, exit from the company, his retirement, was it related to any of the kind of debacles that were happening around the company? Not that it's like, you know, I'm not sitting here going like Sony's on the ropes or anything crazy like that. But, you know, uh, they they embarked on their live service adventure there for a little while. And then suddenly it was like, oh, you guys are fucking burning through money and you've got a bad game to show for it. And these other games got canceled. And, well, we bought Bungie and that's cool. But like <laughs> their numbers just fell off a cliff. And we I, well, shit. Well, shit. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know. Like, what, you know, why do you ship it? Why do you ship it in the first place? If you know it's not going to be some like it. If you're, if you're going into this going like, hey, the only way this thing's going to turn a profit is if it's a massive hit here. At this, at this In this time frame, it needs to be blowing up in a way that we go like, oh my God. Um, surely you could have seen that. I mean, they announced it that summer, th you know, like, I don't know, like not that I'm right 100% of the time or even fucking 50%, you know, whatever, but like just the initial announced trailer for that, you just look at it and go like, this is not, Guys, this, you're not, this is not going to go. This is not going to happen this way. And then they kind of, you know, they showed it off to press in the summer, the summer games fest. And then they had their beta and the beta numbers were not that encouraging. But at that point, you're so close to launch that you, you probably can't pull the plug on it at that point. But I just, I, I, this, the story about how it got to that point is probably an interesting one. Um, Minecraft on the PlayStation 4 will be getting an update soon uh, to remove VR support. Uh, the, the current version of the game does support PlayStation VR rather than maintain that uh, and, and all of that. They are going to remove it from the game. They posted something on minecraft.net uh hang on let me find this because it's like buried in a bunch of patch notes uh our ability to support playstation vr has come to an end and will no longer be supported in updates after march of 2025 
After you receive the final update, you will still receive updates on your PlayStation and be able to play without PlayStation VR. From this point you on, you can keep building in your worlds and your marketplace purchases, including tokens, will continue to be available. You will no longer be able to use your PlayStation VR with Minecraft as it will no longer be supported in the latest updates. That's it. That doesn't sound like that, like something changed on Sony's side in terms of like their ability to support the PlayStation VR. That sounds more like, hey, the people that we devote to making sure that this VR version of the game that no one is using is up to date is not worth it. And so it's smarter, smarter for us to just rip this shit out because none of you are using it anyway. Or the, the 12 people that use it are like, oh, shit. They are, I don't think, it, is it out? Did they, did they ship? They have not shipped the PlayStation 5 version of Minecraft yet, have they? They are doing that, I believe. Um, and that will also not have VR support, uh, presumably. But, um... But, yeah. Uh, so if you're using the PSVR with your PS4 version of Minecraft, I guess, uh, you got six months left on that. So. Huh. Um. In other PlayStation related news, God of War Ragnarok came out on the PC. People are mad. Because it requires a PSN login. Um, they prominently displayed that on the page when they were selling it and, and all of that. They kind of said from the get-go, like, hey, you're going to need a fucking PSN account for this. Um, and this is, as I understand it, the way forward for them. This is, un un unless people are so mad about it here that they, uh, that they, you know, reverse course yet again. But if they were going to reverse course on this, they would have probably not rolled this out. They would have learned from the Helldivers incident. Um, but they want metrics. They want customers. They want people in their ecosystem. Remember, their entire stated goal for PC games or for PlayStation games on PC is we hope that these people then eventually buy it on PlayStation. They hope we hope that they like this game and then when a sequel comes out, they buy it on a PlayStation. They go buy a PlayStation. That is the thing that they are trying to push. They like the money they're getting from PC sales. Don't don't, you know. Don't get it twisted, but uh, but their goal is to grow the number of customers that they can call PlayStation customers and the number of customers they can consider to be inside of the PSN ecosystem. Um, this means that they are not going to sell it in regions where you cannot create a PSN account. I, I just look at it and go like, y they they've made it clear. So the game getting review bombed or whatever from people going like, I can't believe I've got to log into PSN, which there are a number of fucking video games on Steam that do this and don't get review bombed for it uh, because people have just calmed the fuck down about it and gotten used to it. And they're just like, well, this sucks, but, uh, but it is, it's the way of things. I guess I have to wait for the fucking EA app to launch, huh? Well, okay. I guess we're going to stealth launch the, the Ubisoft Connect client in the background here, huh? Hmm. All right. Um, but this being a single player game, it is sort of a different situation. <coughs> and people have released uh, some kind of thing. We'll call it a mod. Um, that, I guess, bypasses the PSN login, if you were so inclined. Um... But like that's the they want they want your email address they want they want to be able to market to you they want to they want to know more about you they they want you in their system they want you making PlayStation friends in the PlayStation friends overlay if you are into that they want you getting into the PlayStation ecosystem in ways that um in in ways that make it 
a little bit more likely for you to buy a PlayStation somewhere down the line. That's all they want, you know. It's just that's that's the business they're in. So expecting them to back down from this. Um when we think about just how stubborn Sony can be about certain things and their general view of the industry you know, on a worldwide basis and, and the fact that they would do this without fixing the problem uh, where people in certain regions can't legally make a PSN account, that just says to me they're like, they've done the math and they're like, yeah, fuck them. The 12 people in this region that won't buy this game now because they can't make a PSN account, those people will either make a PSN account in a different region like everybody else without telling us or they won't buy it. And those 12 feel like, all right, all right, whatever, man. Um, we'll see how it all goes. If this impacts sales in a major way, you could see them rethinking it. But again, Sony's desires on this, this is, this is a mandate. This is their policy. And I wouldn't, I would expect every game they release from here on out to have this requirement unless this impacts them enough that they are not getting what they want. And then maybe they'll make a change. But, um, I don't know. I linked it up once for whatever the first one. Was it uh, Ghost of Tsushima? Was that the first one that did it? I logged into a PSN account back then and it's never asked me for anything ever again because like most other good third-party account tie-up stuff that, that ha exists on Steam... I'm good in quotes, all right? I mean, none of it's fucking great. But the good implementation there is ask for it once, and then every time this company ships a game, it just knows, and it doesn't have to fucking ask you ever again. That's nice, at least, that they did it that way. Um, Whereas, like, yeah, what was that? That when 2K put out that tennis game, like, I have a 2K account, I think I must have, but for whatever reason, it, it wanted me to agree to a bunch of additional stuff and launch a web browser and go through this and that. And I didn't have any of the credentials for it. And it was like, well, I guess I can't even get off the fucking menu of this fucking tennis game because of how fucking broken this is. And it was like legit broken. So I couldn't even like, even as someone who was going to go through it, it was still fucked. So I don't know. 2K's version is, is super jacked. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, the, yes, you, the, are, there are trophies in these games. They do put, you know, PlayStation trophies into it, which is kind of cool. Um, so I, yeah, I don't know, man. I, I don't like, like I get it. I get it because like no one should do any third party login bullshit. Um, on any of these platforms, unless you need to do cross play, that should be, and, and even that should be like, it should be like, hey, when you hit the multiplayer menu, it should pop up a thing saying like, hey, you're going to need to log into this PSN account if you want to play this game online. Or, you know, or, or if the tennis game or, you know, any, any of the 2K stuff or just, any, you know, it should be when you hit a point where they need that information for matchmaking purposes or whatever. Um, or for like, hey, your username is based on your 2K fucking account name. So you better log into that now if you want to play the wrestling game online. Um, I think that all of that stuff, like, is at least sensible. I still think Warframe is the fucking worst defender on this stuff. I fucking, because Warframe makes me log in every goddamn time. And so, you know what? I don't play Warframe. Warframe, and, and Warframe, is, it doesn't, it's not a separate launcher. It's a full screen application with a Warframe sitting there with a gun going, whatever looking around and then there's my email address and password that I got to enter. And so I got to tab out to my password manager, figure it out. And then every time I do it, it's like, dog, we're going to send you an email uh, to, to make sure that you're you. And so I'm like, okay, great. So, okay. So I've gone and gotten my strong password, copied it out of my password manager, put it into your fucking thing. And you're still going to fucking two factor me even though this is my Steam account and you could be fucking, I'd already two-factor on my fucking Steam account, you could fucking piggyback onto the littlest bit of this fucking infrastructure that you're using. But no! Then I gotta fucking load up my email client all while the game is still running in the fucking background to get a six-digit fucking number out of it. Then it will let me log in. I'm like, fucking leave me alone. 
Like, holy shit. You know what's easier? Not playing Warframe. And a lot of that is because, you know, you're downloading, like, you can go download the launcher from their website and, and run it outside of Steam if you want, right? Um, but they do it every time. It doesn't, it doesn't keep my password. It doesn't, like, go, oh, your Steam account and your Warframe account are now tied up forever. And so we're good now. Every time you launch it from Steam, the console versions do that. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure the console versions don't ask me for a password every time. I've not spent much time with Warframe on console. Um, but what the fuck, dude? Like, for as apparently popular as Warframe is, um, it's stupid that I have to do this as often as I like, like basically literally and in every time I launch Warframe, which is not all that often, I will grant you. But the idea that it is not just like silently going like, okay, yeah. Okay, we, this is your Steam account, so we know this is you. And never, ever doing it again. Seriously, what the fuck? It's been years. It's been years of that. Um, absolutely insane. But maybe, again, maybe it's because I only play Warframe once a year. You know, like, I'm sure that the email verification probably wouldn't happen every time. But it still does demand that I enter my password every time. Which is already too much. I mean, at least the PSN thing is you just fucking log in once and then any game from them you buy in the future is still fucking good to go. Just merge it with your PSN account and it should skip that. Nope. I mean, I, I, have, I have linked all platforms because I wanted to get all the achievements and trophies that I, that I got on PC. I wanted to unlock them all on, PS, on PlayStation and Xbox. So I did that a while back. Um, and so every single time I launch it, it asks me for my Warframe account password. And so every time I have to tab out, so I, I, I don't play it on a steam deck. I would never, I would never install it on a steam deck because I don't have the password. I'm not going to manually type in the fucking arcane fucking etchings that I use as fucking strong passwords these days. Fuck that. Um, it's ridiculous. Nintendo has filed a, uh, has submitted a new device to the FCC over the weekend. This comes from The Verge. Um, has a model number of CLO001, which doesn't necessarily line up with the, or rather, you know, yeah, the, the Verge is speculating that this means it's probably an entirely new product line considering the Switch was HAC001 and the DS was NTR001. The Game Boy was DMG01. Um, and so this not being a crazy higher number means that it's probably something brand new. It is listed as a wireless device not a game console or a controller, which would be labeled a, a separate way. They have a basic diagram here, which looks like a, a rounded rectangle. Cause they, they have to show basically where on the, on the device itself, the FCC like tag would be or where the, the information about it would be. And so they have a picture of the bottom side of it or a, a drawing, but it is literally a white rounded triangle with another thing in there and then some numbers etched on it um, to say, hey, here's where the serial number would be when we make these things. In terms of technology inside of the thing, you know, because they're filing with the FCC, they're looking to get wireless technology cleared and they say it's going to have a 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi radio and a 24 gigahertz uh, what was that millimeter wave sensor MM wave? It's a millimeter wave, right? I forget. Or is it just MM wave? And so those things are worked. Uh, those things are used in motion sensors and motion tracking devices, like radar style things of like, hey, there was motion in this room. 
which you, you would think is maybe so the, obviously the the mind immediately jumps to well this is clearly the successor to the switch but the the details don't line up with that because the switch would probably have more than just a 2.4 gigahertz wi-fi radio and whatever this mm wave sensor is um Are they making something that you set in your are Are they making a new connect hi are they making the connect again Are they making an uh, updated connect Are they making updated motion controls Are they making Is it something yeah is it something that you would plug into the t the top port of a switch too that would give it something some sort of motion tracking are you going to play pokemon go 2 on a switch tethered to your phone with this thing plugged into it so you can sense the movement of pokemon out you know i um The Verge's speculation is kind of all over the place too. They say, so what is it? Guesses include a new gesture control interface, an upgraded dock for some kind of device uh, at the Super Nintendo World theme park, which, yeah, okay, sure. Maybe it's just a thing that you use at the theme park. Or maybe even a return to the quality of life sleep tracking initiative Nintendo attempted a decade ago. It could also be something to support AR features by detecting real world objects meaning it could be used for new Mario Kart Live hardware or even a Pokemon Go-like system. Um, so yeah, I, I, that's a... It's a head-scratcher. And maybe it's just an idea that they had that will never surface in anything ever. You know, maybe they're just like, oh, hey, here's, you know, something we want to do. But yeah, some kind of AR, like, hey, we're going to map your room. But are they going to, like, could they do that and combine it with a camera? Could they do that and have you doing connect shit with it hooked up to a TV? Not undocked, obviously. Um, or, yeah, could it be for some kind of, yeah, chibi robot? Yeah, like some some kind of, like, hey, we made a cool robot toy thing. And this detects where it is in the room and it detects where you are in the room so it doesn't run you over. And, you know, like there's a lot of weird toy like things that this could be used for in terms of like sensing the size and shape of a room um, or detecting people in a room. Maybe this is in case you want to watch Netflix on it. It will detect if you have more than eight people in the room and block playback. Absolutely not. Are you trying to watch Monday Night Raw with nine people? Absolutely not. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. Maybe this is a thing where they're going to just, they're, you're going to take pictures of your room and then they're going to go, look, it, Mario is in there with you. Who knows? Or again, maybe this never turns into anything at all and it's just a device that they had ideas about that they decided not to pursue to completion anything is possible why don't we get into some emails podcast at guard.bike is the email address uh, send your emails to me and I will read them and I will pluck some of them for the show and we will talk about them like this one from uh, Matthew, who has a Switch question. On the podcast last week, you talked about how new consoles benefit from a fresh interface. What do you want out of a Switch 2 interface? Do you think Nintendo will keep their weird separate mobile app? Or is this the generation they finally get it together? Uh, oh, I mean, no, they're not. They are not going to get it together. If you're talking about like online functionality and no, no, definitely not. The stuff they have now for that stuff works well enough for them. Um, I could see them wanting to 
maybe make it a little bit better if they are to, if they want to bring more third parties onto the platform third parties make a lot of online games and so on and so forth if they want to obviously Fortnite has done really well on the Switch you know if they want to make that an easier experience for more developers there is some things they could do at the system level to make that a little more inviting and endearing um but no I don't I don't think so um, I think the stuff they have works well enough. You know, the, like some of it's a hassle, but also who cares? Like, you know, what's a hassle getting friend requests on Xbox live again. When people could have just followed. Um, I think if you care enough about playing online games on a switch with your friends, you'll jump through the hoops to do it. And some of those hoops include just holding the switches near each other and letting them dock or whatever. Um, like, I think that stuff works well enough. And they will almost certainly use the same accounts going forward. So I assume that nothing, or very few things will change about the online infrastructure on the console. Um, in terms of interface... From Nintendo specifically, I want eShop music. I would also love to see a more integrated shop. Um, like when you go to the eShop, it takes forever to get it to load up. And when it gets there, like it really just feels like, yo man, here's a, we, we wrapped this around a web page. And it, it runs as sluggishly as it could. Like something that was actually snappy and a little more, uh, a little more client side. And obviously you got to fetch the text and whatever else, you know, server side, but, but something that was just a cleaner, faster experience there. with Some nice music. I, I would like to see street pass or some kind of equivalent. I think street pass is cool. Um, and having something just something fun like that some kind of like fun like hey you had your switch in your bag and as a result it went with you, with you on these travels and and as because of that you now you have this like something like that something like street pass um i think would be really nice um just something fun and toy like i mean like the, the it's there's, I think the general interface of the Switch in terms of like, hey, you're downloading a game. Hey, you're picking a game. Like, could those menus be a little cleaner? Probably. I don't know. They're fine. You get used to them and it's whatever, right? Um, so that stuff could be cleaner and, and, and more effective, but like, yeah. Um, so I think what I would really want is like, hey, like, I want, you know, hey, bring, yeah, bring back the me verse, you know, bring back the weird message board. Don't actually, I mean, I don't know. The last thing we need as a society is more message boards, to be honest. Probably need less, fewer, fewer message boards, but street pass. I think that'd be really fun. Um, to share things with strangers as you wander around. I think that'd be cool. I would like that a lot, um, especially like if they could blow it up into you know like a system level game like the Street Pass games were. Those were awesome. After a while, that was the only thing I was using my 3DS for was puzzle pieces. Um, even you know even if they did a thing where hey we're gonna make a mobile app that's going to tie into your phone's health data so that we know the number of steps you took and then we're going to turn those into play coins as opposed to having the switch in your pocket draining battery as you shake it. Like something that was like, hey, we're, we're, you know, even if they offloaded a lot of that functionality to phones um, instead of having to carry your switch around, that might be like a fun, cool, weird thing, uh, a weird way to do it, but I don't know. Something like that would just be fun. Dave writes in about Virtua Fighter 6. 
Uh, he says, with the buzz around a potential VF6 and so many years since the last installment, it got me thinking about who might be best to helm the project. Uh, VF5 was well received and uh, Daichi Katagiri got Yu Suzuki's blessing to continue the series, but he and his team might be tied up with the Yakuza series. Yu Suzuki, on the other hand, has been making his return to game development over the past few years and doesn't have any announced projects at the moment. Is Yu Suzuki the right person to lead Virtua Fighter 6? Or does the series need new blood? What do you think about his recent output in general? His core fans love his latest games, but where does he fit in today's gaming landscape? I, you know, look. Yu Suzuki is a legendary figure in video games. I don't, I don't know that he's kept current enough to run a project the size of, of, v, of VF6 even if it was going to be a smaller game in general. Um, I think Yu Suzuki would be best served by going out and, and making more Shenmue games for the people that want that. Even more broken as time goes on. <laughs> you know? Um, the thing, the, 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 what is the, what is the name of it? Um, The thing that just came out, Air Twister. Which came out on consoles, I didn't realize that. Which came out on consoles at full price. Oh no, okay. Maybe it hasn't actually come out. It says release date 2024. But they're still taking pre-orders for them. Uh, they're trying to get $70 for a, well it's a collector's edition. That comes with what? The soundtrack? A bio booklet, an autograph card. Air Twister's not a great game. I played all the way through Air Twister. I unlocked a lot of stuff. Air Twister is a weird phone game that a lot of the progression is built in such a way that you can tell that they were going to monetize it in a variety of ways. Um, and then I think when it came to Apple Arcade, and so it like all of that stuff kind of got lifted out of it, and and but it's still the progression in that game was super broken. Yeah, okay, so they, they brought it to PC eventually. They must have brought it to console around that same time and that these are just like physical versions that, that haven't come out yet or, or whatever. It's not an awesome game. The soundtrack is like kind of funny. It's clever. It like, you know, it's like one artist and it's like this bootleg queen guy that sounds like a bootleg Freddie Mercury and he's, he's talented in his own right and, and all of that, but it's like, it's like a not awesome Panzer Dragoon. It's like, you know, from, from the guy that made Space Harrier, you're, you're very excited to see it. And you see elements in there where you're like, oh, it's kind of like Space Harrier in this specific way. But like, it, it's just not an awesome game. I appreciate that it was made. I had an okay time playing it. Um... But it's not, it's not, yeah, I don't know. Okay, it was, it was 25 bucks and it's half off right now. 1250 is not a terrible price to pay for that game, I guess. I don't know. But it's not, yeah, not a great game. Um, anyway, so I, I, I think that like fighting games kind of need more than, than what I perceive Yu Suzuki to be interested in doing right now. Um, and so I, I don't know that he would necessarily be the guy to do it. Not that, you know, the head of a project is coding every single frame of animation and balance and all that other stuff. You know, I'm sure he could do something he's done it before. Um, but I was, I would assume that would be something that would come from the, like a dragon team, you know, that that'd be something that would come out of the RGG studio and, um, uh, whether category would, would run it or, or someone else. Like I, I think that they have proven. I think VF5 proved that there is a future for that franchise uh, after Yu Suzuki for sure. Um, I mean, it, I forget what his credit was on four, but it was like kind of not. Anyway, anyway, the point being, I think that there's people involved in that process that could very easily or, or, or could very easily run the VF6 project. I don't know that you necessarily 
need to get Yu Suzuki back in there to make it happen. Uh, if that if that answers your question, it'd be fun to have him involved in some way, but uh, but I don't know. Uh, I think at this point, you you maybe don't need it. Um, Detlev writes in, yes, Detlev. I'm sure that's your. Is this actually Detlev Shrimp? Do you think? Um, what would your personal ranking of NBA games published by Midway look like? Is the question. I myself am fond of Jam and Jam TE. I absolutely adore Hangtime and Showtime. I detest hoops and never got around to playing any of the games released with the Ballers branding. Yeah. So I think that the that that sequence of games that are NBA Jam or NBA Jam derivative meaning hang time and show time and to a lesser extent hoops hoops sucks hoops is like a sequel to showtime where they made it like three on three and so there was like an ai guy and so it's like they're trying to make it vaguely a little bit more like actual basketball and i think it just it's not a good game it's not pure like showtime was i guess showtime actually was 3v3 anyway um so hang time, which is the game they made once they lost the rights to the name NBA jam because acclaim, uh, got it and made some rotten games with the NBA jam name on them. Um, I think hang time is pretty good. I think hang time is really good or in maximum hang time. The follow up to it is like a really good sweet spot between jam and showtime. I played so much goddamn NBA showtime because we had a, a cabinet in the office for a long time and uh i played a fucking lot i got a rash um i got a rash on my hands because we had an nba showtime cabinet in the office and someone kept coming through i don't know if it was the cleaning staff or what but they kept spraying like glass cleaner or some kind of like cleaner onto the the control surface and the sticks and they'd wipe it down every night and something about the quantity the amount of times they were doing that like i my hands got disgusting and then we finally realized what was like i was like what the fuck is causing this and i realized it was it was because they were spraying shit on the cabinet every fucking day um And so we got them to stop and everything, everything was fine. Um, and we cleaned it ourselves with something that was a little less harsh. Um, I think Jam and NBA Jam Tournament Edition are great games. Those early versions of Tournament Edition that still had Mortal Kombat characters in them are always fun. Um, but it's hard to rank them. I think the, the original NBA Jam probably ends up being at the bottom of the list of these games just because a lot of the games that came after it were a lot better. Um, NBA Jam, obviously, a, a, it's a classic, right? What, do you, what the fuck am I going to, you know, it's NBA fucking Jam. I don't even like basketball. I don't even like sports. Um, but Hang Time's pretty good. Hang Time was a, a N64 launch game. And so it was the sort of thing where it's like, eh, it, like as a home game, it's sort of weird because the value proposition is off, but like the game itself was, was fine. Um, hoops is not a great game. The NBA ballers games. Look, they're not they're, I tried, I, I really tried, I really tried with each and every NBA ballers game to get into it. But it just never, like, it had everything but the gameplay. It's just the, the system of moves you were doing and the counters to those moves and everything that that game was about being that kind of like one-on-one -on -one or that, that much smaller kind of more half-court experience or whatever. Um, or, the, you know, the nature of NBA ballers as, as a smaller game in some ways more about handles, more about almost fighting game style moves that you were doing to sort of keep the ball, get around the guy, break some ankles, score, like like that stuff. 
I never enjoyed that in any of those. I guess th- was, there was three, right? There's Ballers, Ballers Two, and what, Ballers Phenom, or is there just or there's just two of them, Ballers and Ballers Phenom? I can't remember. I like that Jurassic Five song where they took what's golden and instead of saying what's golden is it, it just ball, the callers the NBA ballers I like that I like the version of what's golden that they did where they changed the words to be about NBA ballers I don't know that, that ever I, did that make it into any of the games or did they just perform that at E3 and I'm the only fucking person left that remembers it I don't know um Ballers, yeah, man. I, you know, I remember Ballers had online support and I was reviewing Ballers and could not find a single person playing it online. Kept trying, kept trying, kept trying. Different times of the day, all that stuff. Just like week of release. Uh, never, never found anyone. Um, yeah, I... I wanted to like NBA ballers, but uh, yeah, no, it, it just it never it never quite worked out. And NBA Street, you know, I don't know. People always talk about NBA Street, and NBA Street has gone on to become this legendary thing. And I know there are people at Midway that I think have a grudge about some of the NBA Street stuff because they they look at it and go like, "Oh, that's our camera code. This guy that was on our team that left to go over there took all of our camera shit over there and used it all." Which I don't, you know, I'm not in a position to verify that one way or the other, but I wouldn't doubt it. Um, NBA Street, those were some good games, but I don't, I don't know that I fucking love them the way that other people do. Like people really fucking go hard for the NBA Street games. And I was like, oh man, these games were cool um, and very playable and, and all of that shit. Like they're, they're very good games, but I just, I don't know. Like I don't have... I would not say that I have a passion for the NBA Street Series um, the way I do for Showtime and Jam and and Hangtime, you know? Um, like, yeah, th- those games are, are amazing. Um, but, uh, but, yeah. Um... Tony and Todd Morton rides in and says, uh, ask some questions about the Mister, the FPGA based retro gaming device. Uh, and he asks, what do you make of these Mister clones? Are they just as good as the real deal, but cheaper? So if you've been following the Mister scene, there's a, a couple of different, there's a QM tech and was it Taki Udon? I think is the other name. Um, that have basically made, Mr. Compatible hardware that is a lot cheaper than buying the the original FPGA dev board that people use as the basis of the Mr. And so they've been able to bring prices down quite a bit um, on buying a full packaged Mr. And, and everything from, you know, through the pandemic that was getting up to like five or six hundred dollars in some cases. And now you're getting kind of full stacks for like 250 300 something in that range so like it's a significant discount the thing i'll say is that people have started getting their takiudon um mr clones and they're running the ram test on it and finding that the ram is not good at like like basically the ram cannot withstand a high enough frequency Um, in some cases, like it works fine for most things, but you're going to run into some problems where it's like, oh, this Ram is not fast enough for certain cores on the mister or, or whatever. It sounds like the people responsible for those sticks of Ram are aware of the issue and are looking into it and that they're going to swap people out that have bad Ram or, or questionable Ram. It's not even necessarily that it's bad Ram. It's that it's just not mem testing high enough. Um, and that, yeah, yes, there's some other bunk usb boards and some other weird stuff here and there so you know i'm not going to say you get what you pay for because this whole thing is ramshackle as it fucking gets i buy all my stuff from a dude in idaho i bought like the pretty much except for the very first mister that i bought 
Uh, I've bought most of my stuff from MrAddons.com, and he's not offering. I, last time I checked, he, I don't think he's selling any of the clone stuff. Um, but all of it is crazy. All of it is like a dude making stuff because all these sources, all these designs are open source. Like if you were a smart enough person, you could make all this stuff yourself. I'm not. And so I buy it from my man in Idaho. Um, and uh, he's, he's, been, he's been good to me. Not, that's not to say he's given me a discount or anything. I've ordered from that place multiple times and it's, it's always been, been good. But, you know, yeah, these, these clones are, are significantly less expensive. And, um, and that's definitely cool because misters are getting fucking expensive. So if you were going to get in now, I would look at the, I, I, I would look at the, the boards that are, that are out there. Um, the, some of the, and, and the, so these, the, the main boards are technically clones because the, the main boards are not being just made by a dude. The main board is something that like Intel makes or whatever and sells a Terrasic or, you know, whatever the, the company is. Um, and so that main the, the main FPGA board that sits at the heart in the middle of this thing that's the part that's most important to clone because if you could make that cheaper that's going to that's going to be the thing that's going to have the biggest impact on the price the rest of that stuff can kind of be made by anybody um and uh and i did the other thing i don't have an answer to is if you could get a one a, like one of these clone boards and then if you could go get anyone's add-ons for it i think the qm tech stuff needs its own its own usb hub and its own stuff i'm not positive on that i've not been following it super closely but i you know it, some people have been happy with the clones but there have been some issues for sure um and so i would probably right now i would say wait it out a little bit and see where this all lands um, most of it's sold out right now anyway, so, you know, you, you couldn't exactly pull the trigger on a clone board right now anyway. Um, but if the Taki Udon stuff is interchangeable, yeah, which someone in chat is saying it's supposed to be, as far as they know, um, then you could just get their main board and then go get RAM from Mr. Add-ons and a USB board from Mr. Add-ons and, a you know, a Snacks 64 board uh you know add uh, and cables and stuff from him and probably put all that stuff on it the mr stuff is cool the mr scene has gotten weird you know there's like they like for a while there was a mortal Kombat core in development and then then someone said oh it doesn't seem like this is actually going to be possible to run on the mr and they're like well it could probably run on an analog pocket because the analog pocket has a few things where it's better than a mr but a few things where it's worse but it, it was probably better in the right ways where it could run the Mortal Kombat arcade core. And then there was a crew of people that are working on something that is supposed to be advanced and a bigger device and a more uh, expansive and more capable unit. But their updates are very few and far between to where now I think most people are just like, eh, believe it when we see it, if those guys are actually going to do anything. Um, and I hope they do. But it's a me it's it's I guess point being it's messy right now. You've got a lot of people with different Patreons talking shit about each other in, in weird ways, and you're just like, this is oh, this is a scene. Okay, yeah, this is a scene now, and now everyone's gonna talk shit about everybody else all the time. I see how it is. Um I've been adjacent to scenes like this for decades. The emulation scene has been full of shit like this for a very long time. Um and so I don't know, man. Dude in Utah, uh, dude in, in Idaho, man. It's, it's, maybe that's what you need. Uh, this is also, what do you play your mister on? A CRT? You, do you fuck around with a retro tank at all? So I have a retro tank 4K, and I've got the mister hooked up through that. You can, well, I was saying you can maybe see the retro tank. I've had to stack some things because I got this new PC in here. I had to move a bunch of stuff around. It's a mess. Um. But the Mister runs through the RetroTink 4K, and it's fucking rad. Um, but I'm not using it all that often because um, I like retro achievements, and that's something that only exists in software emulators. Um, 
and I'm just, I don't know, I'm focused on these screens here and I don't, I don't necessarily like to turn over to this screen over here. <laughs> Is that a weird thing? That's a weird thing. I don't know. But it feels like a process. I know like there was, there was, um, a CDI core in development. I don't know where that got to. I haven't checked on in on it lately, but you know, it sounds like that was making progress and, um, I would love to see that. I would love to see a 3DO core. I would love to see the Jaguar core get nailed. I would love to see a more powerful part out there, like a, a better FPGA that can run even more stuff, ideally while still being compatible with all of this Mr. Stuff. That'd be nice, but you know, not definitely not guaranteed. Um, but uh, yeah, well, that, whole, that whole scene, that whole scene. The Mr. is really great. I'm not, I'm just not, I'm not using it as much as I, used to, but like I, I have a dance mat in the garage. I'm going to bring in and, and probably get back into DDR and specifically the PlayStation one DDR games. Um, and I, I just want to play a lot of third mix. And so, uh, you know, I, I bought the snack cave, the snacks cables necessary to hook real PlayStation controllers up to the mister. And so I will probably, I could even use real DDR. Well, I mean, yeah, I, I also have a USB dance mat, but maybe that would be, that would result in too much input lag. I don't know. We'll, we'll experiment when I get some time. Um, Harvest writes in and says the announcement of PS one style PlayStation five pro got me thinking about special edition consoles and colorways. Since it's part of your job to have the newest, latest console as early as possible, I assume that your console owning history largely consists of hardware in their default launch window SKUs and colors. If the overall function of the console is the same, there's far less of a need for you to drop further cash on limited edition color or new form factor like a slim model. You're not wrong. That hasn't, that did not stop me from, well, I mean, you know, when they added an HDMI port to the Xbox 360, that was a very big deal. Um, for, you know, the quality of the output as well as capture and, and everything else changed. So I bought every one of the Xbox 360 upgrades, even the 360 E that they put out there at the end, mostly because I was curious about it and they weren't going to send them out. But I felt like, well, we should get a look at one of these so we can talk about it on a podcast or something like that. So there's, there's not, you're right, but there are occasionally weird whether it's just desires on sick desires on my part or what have you, I have, I have purchased consoles over the years. I have fucking, I'm going to say there are at least five PlayStation twos here. I have four original Xboxes, but I don't know what revisions they are. I just ended up with them. It's not, but like, I bought a PS2 at launch. I bought a Japanese PS2 at launch. I bought a cool ass blue PS2. When those came out, um, I have a slim PS2. I think I have, I have a slim PS2 and I have a silver slim PS2 that's all dented up. Like, I don't know where it came from. It was not something I bought, but I ended up with it just the same. Um, you know, sometimes people send me video. Just sometimes, I, sometimes you end up with stuff. Uh, people have definitely sent video games my way to the PO box, which is, I think, if you're watching on Twitch, it's below. It's below my face right here. People have sent uh, a lot of their leftover video games to me over the years, and so I've ended up with PS2s. And I've I I opened a box the other day, and it was the dirtiest Sega Genesis I've ever seen. And I was like, I have no idea where this came from. And I also have a test kit PS2. Um, at least one of those. Anyway, so you, so you just, you end up with stuff, right? Um, and you buy, st you know, like a, the, 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 some of those PS2s were like, I'm in Japan. This clear blue PS2 just came out. It's sick. And I'm here. I'm right here. I'm standing right here. I could just grab this and give this man my credit card and then we will bow to each other and he will hand it back to me. I, I'm going to buy a fucking clear blue PlayStation 2, goddamn, and, and then you end up with it and you're like, well, shit. Shit, man. 
that's just how it goes. Um, I almost, so before I get to the rest of your question, I almost bought a slim quote unquote PS five when those came out, when they re when they put out the updated PS five that were like ever so slightly smaller, I was very curious it was pure curiosity. It was just like, I want to see what one of these things looks like next to a regular PS5. Like I, and, and I was standing there at the fucking Best Buy. This was around Christmas time last year. And they just had a mountain of them with Spider-Man bundled in right by checkout. And I, I forget what I was there buying. I was buying something fucking stupid. Um, and I'm looking at him and I'm going like, I would like to know. And it, a lot of that is driven by, and it doesn't matter at the end of the day, other people have done the work. It's the internet, right? But there's a part of me that is like, I would like to be able to speak to this. I would like to be able, if a question comes up about the differences between the PS5s, I would like to be able to say, yeah, it's, it's a little bit slimmer, but who fucking cares? which is probably the exact right take on it, even though I've never seen one in person. But there's a part of me that feels like I should see it for myself. I should know. Um, and so I almost bought one. I, I, like, I, I pulled out at the last minute, I'm like standing there staring at him, and I'm like, I gotta go. I get the fuck out of here. Like, should I buy one of these? No, fuck it. Maybe I'll, no, yeah, maybe not today. Not today. Fuck it. And I left it. And there's, and, and so I ended up not getting one. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 I would say that it is driven by, you know, the job and, and, and what I feel like I need to do there. But honestly, if we want to go a, another layer deep on that and really in, get introspective about it, I think it's really easy to use that as an excuse to just fucking buy some new shit. Well, it's my job. God damn it. I should know. I should know this. God damn it. I should know. It's real easy. Now, in some of these cases, it actually does matter, right? When the PS5 Pro comes out, I am going to have to get one. You know, like that's not a, like I, I, I need to be able to speak to that. Like that's something where there is potentially an actual difference or what if there isn't that's something that is worth being able to talk about and so that is something i will need to i i, I need one of those one way or the other if they're going to send them out i i need to i need to contact them and be like hey are you doing anything for reviews for these or because i would like to review i mean i have i have spent more than a playstation 5 pro on replacing and upgrading capture gear here to ensure that I would be one of the people completely capable of capturing PS5 Pro games at a fucking really high bit rate. If I wanted to go down that rabbit hole and start putting up crazy high bit rate videos for people wanting to do comparisons and all that stuff, like I'm just about equipped to do it. Um just about there so so yeah i don't know uh so yeah I, I i very much do want to want to look at that stuff and see that stuff and um yeah anyway the rest of the question here has there ever been any special edition consoles that compelled you to pick up a second unit purely for aesthetic reasons i guess we kind of covered that have there been any limited print or region exclusive consoles that you regret skipping what are your thoughts on the Hello Kitty Dreamcast? So, yes. So, I... There's a handful. I would have really liked to have had a Net Yorose, the black PlayStation 1, but they were always too expensive. Um, I want... I still... I don't even like the fucking console. And there's a part of me that feels stupid for not owning a Panasonic Q. You know, a GameCube that could actually play DVDs and is fucking sick ass chrome mirrored finish. Like it's just, it's the, it looks so good. 
Um, but they were always too expensive. Every time I saw one, they were always just like, eh, this is just a little too much money. I just don't, I don't, no, I'm not going to go for it. Um, a, a JVC Wonder Mega or an XI, the, the Genesis with a Sega CD built into it, the JVC put out. I would really like to own one of those because they just look cool. Uh, don't, don't need it. No reason to have it, but it looks cool. Um, I don't have a Hello Kitty Dreamcast. It'd be cool to have a Hello Kitty Dreamcast. I do have the Sega Sports Dreamcast. I have one of those new in box that's never been used. Uh, and that's the black Dreamcast. Uh, but it has the Sega Sports logo on the top. So it's kind of like, it's cool that it's a black Dreamcast. Kind of a bummer that it just says Sega Sports on it. King English says, I had an N-Gage like a dumbass. I've got an N-Gage. I've got like five N-Gages. I've got like three N-Gage QDs. And I have like, I, maybe, I get, maybe I get rid of them. I had like three N-Gage prototypes that are just regular N-Gages. I don't think there's anything too special about them. But um, I got like fucking four Gizmondos, man. Like it's, it's a, you know, it's, it's whatever. Um, but yeah, the, the Hello Kitty Dreamcast is great. The full setup would be awesome. That'd be cool to have. Um, but I don't even have a regular Dreamcast hooked up here. I have a Dreamcast with the top lid autographed by John Carmack. And I took that lid off and set it aside because I needed to mod that Dreamcast. And also because I bought a cool clear shell for it that I wanted to put on instead. And so I took that one off to put the new one on. And, and so now I just have a top lid of a fucking Sega Dreamcast. Like the, the top half of the shell with fucking Carmack's signature on the lid. This is like, well, all right. Which I won at QuakeCon by being good at Quake on the Dreamcast using this big dumb orb controller that they were selling for the uh you know for use on the dreamcast um and i beat the other eight people that were in the tournament that was a fun trip we just hung out with because sega was putting out quake 3 on the dreamcast and so they're like do you want to come to to quake con i'm like yeah I, fucking yes i would love to go to quake con and uh and i never really had a reason to go because i wasn't covering pc games and so I went to QuakeCon and just hung out with the folks from Sega PR. We went to fucking, we went to Papa Doe and I ate fish that had a head on it. It was terrifying as a young man who had never done that before. Stuck with me. That part of the trip, that part of the trip stuck with me. Um... Tom from Queens. Right, so it says Samoa Joe is in the Yakuza a pirate game. Which other wrestlers would you like to see added to long running franchises to spice things up and in what capacity? Did you see this? Did you see this? Samoa Joe's in this fucking this Hawaiian Yakuza game. This pirate Yakuza. It looks looks fucking awesome. Samoa Joe is great. Samoa Joe should be in a lot of stuff. Samoa Joe should be in a lot more stuff than he is in. And he's been in some stuff. Been in a lot of video game related stuff, right? I mean, the Twisted Metal TV show, this thing, Suicide, Suicide Squad. Um, Samoa Joe is fantastic. Uh, and and I think he's he's just got such a a manner about him. He carried, you know, the, the way that his character is carried, I think fits into a lot of different types of roles that, that a, a video game that needs tough guys would have. I think the Yakuza is the franchise, the, the like a dragon franchise. We all, we all need to, we all need to step it up in our replacing the word Yakuza with like a dragon. We all need to get started getting it right. Um, I think the way they have used wrestlers in those games has been fucking awesome. It's so cool. And it's a great fit. 
a lot of the time, right? So, uh, and and I think Samoa Joe is a great addition to that canon, uh, to that grand tradition that uh, that they have had. So, uh, what other wrestlers would you like to see added to long running franchises to spice things up? Put Sami Zayn into Katamari Damashi. How about that? That's just, I don't know. That, that's what came out of my mouth, and I'm sticking with it. I'm sticking with it. All ska soundtrack. You know that would work. Yeah, 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 sure. Put John Moxley in Tekken. You know, he could be Brian Fury. You know? Like, make a, a, a Moxley skin for Brian Fury. Get him in the studio and ask him to go <laughs> uh, really well and uh, just use that. Sure. You could do that. I don't know. That's not the most interesting thing, I guess. But, uh, you know, um, I still think that Excalibur and Taz should be doing commentary for fighting games. I think that, you know, I, I, I said that when, when they announced the commentary feature in Street Fighter VI which, you know, did not necessarily find success the way that maybe some people thought it might. Um, my initial reaction was, the, holy shit, they've got to put Excalibur and Taz in this doing commentary. I maintain that they should be doing, like, canned commentary in a fighting game. It, not necessarily tournament, you know, I, I, don't, they don't, I don't need them to go out and learn... Uh, and, and learn actual fighting games and you know or or whatever to do cohesive and competent actual live tournament commentary. I just want them to be fed lines and and do their shtick, do their stuff while a fighting game is played. I still think that would be I think that would be huge. Um Yeah, I don't know. There, there's a there's a lot of stuff. I don't know, but that's <laughs> Pat says. Put Eddie Kingston in GTA Six. Put Eddie Kingston in anything, man. He's make a new fucking Def Jam icon, but somehow Eddie Kingston is also in it as himself. You know. Um. Yes, call the match, dude. Yeah, th yes. AW Dark is sorely missed because of the commentary. You get you get bits and pieces of that magic on the uh, the the fight TV broadcasts because during the picture in picture they still get to talk, and I think Tony Schiavone has been fun in a lot of those spots as well. Um, but uh, but yeah. Um, Let's see. I'm going to take one more here before we get going. Matt from Seattle asks if the Dreamcast was limited by its single analog stick. And says, if the Dreamcast had held on for a few more years, do you think it would have been limited by the single stick? About the time Sega ended uh, sales is when Halo made huge advancements for console first-person shooters. Combine that with Call of Duty, Time Splitters, SOCOM, Killzone, etc., and all the other games that used dual stick controls. Would Sega have put out a new dual stick Dreamcast controller? Sh sure. Yeah. I mean, yes. The way games went in the years following the Dreamcast all but required you to have a controller with dual analogs. Um, if the Dreamcast was still viable, which in this fantasy scenario, you're saying it was. Uh, would they have updated the controller? Sure. If they wanted to have those types of games on the on the console, they would have eventually had to update the controller because otherwise they would have just been behind. Um, maybe if they had issued a new controller, they could have had the cord coming out the right side. That, you know, that would have been... That would have been nice. Uh, True Blue Venus asks, how's AEW doing? I want to get back in it. I, 
I like it a lot. They've, uh, they're in a kind of a weird place story wise right now where it feels like they're kind of between things or, or things are kind of still building. And so there are a few things happening that you just kind of look at and go like, I'm not really sure where this is going to go. And eh, I don't know. Um, but, uh, I, that, I, I watch all of the wrestling that they put on television. Um, and it never feels like a waste of time. That's for sure. I, I have just about completely checked out of WWE. Someone was asking about that. I, I just don't like, I had been watching raw every week and SmackDown. Now I'm kind of like, watching maybe 20 minutes of raw and then going like, Oh, I don't need to watch this. I can turn this off and then turning it off. And then, uh, with SmackDown, I I'll watch it or I'll, you know, I'll watch what I, what I'm around for. Cause sometimes the kids are going to bed and, and whatever, but like I, there's nothing. I was into the CM Punk and Drew McIntyre stuff when they first started it because it was really clever and fun and felt refreshing. And they're still doing it a lot of months later in a way that I'm just like, dude, can't I cannot watch any more of this um the little football stadium promo thing they filmed with Roman Reigns and Cody Rhodes was like an interesting cinematic sort of deal and you know had a very different look than a lot of the other things that they do and it was maybe a little overproduced but it was like still kind of cool and I, yeah I don't know man it, it's like w there's nothing necessarily wrong with WWE from a programming standpoint let's say, but I'm just not feeling it. The characters are not resonating with me right now it, on, on much of anything that they're doing. Um, where I'm just like watching it and going like, oh, I just, I, I'm, I'm not invested. The most, the, the closest I am to invested in anything that's happening there is anything with, you know, or the, the, the new day stuff where like, are they going to break up? What's going on? What the, oh my God. Like, like that's, at least like a little bit interesting. And I hope they don't do that because they said they wouldn't. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm enjoying AEW. It, it like, not everything they do is a fucking banger, but like, I think that they are very interesting and I think they're doing a lot of fun stuff and a lot of crazy shit. Like the last pay-per-view thing with the, as violent as it was, was, it was a spectacle, man. It was, it was worth, worth seeing, I would say. But uh, I don't know, man. Wrestling. Um, wrestling waxes and wanes. It always does. Because they're always at some different part of the story and things are starting and not stopping and something climaxes and then you're like, is anything new coming out of this? And is it good? Is it like, I don't know. Again, um, this stuff's always a little, a little hit and miss, but I think that's just the nature of the art form, right? Uh, let's see. I think that's going to do it for us here. Thanks everybody for listening. Um, <coughs> be back tomorrow with some stuff. I know Sony's doing its state of play, uh, today, uh, in a couple hours here, but today, is flu shot day for the kids and uh and the baby is sick and a lot this is just a lot of stuff happening today so i i cannot watch that live but what i might do is i might watch that tonight and if i do i'll stream it out um and then uh you know i'll, I'll just I'll, I'll avoid the news because i'll be too busy to read it in real time anyway and um you know, we can, um, maybe, maybe you can watch that with me. You will probably already know what's going to happen, but I might not. And, uh, maybe that'll be fun or maybe it won't. I don't know. We'll see. Or maybe the kids will react poorly to their flu shots and be up all night and I won't be able to do any of that. So <laughs> we'll see how it all goes. Um, so take care of yourselves. Otherwise, uh, I'll be here Wednesday and Friday doing some stuff with video games. And be back on Tuesday with the podcast. See you then.